Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming here. Um, it's great to see everybody. I know a lot of you, but not all of you, and I'm happy, happy to see you here. And also really happy to be able to talk to my great crew here about the thriving ocean, um, which, you know, I hope all of you were able to just hear Bob Ballard, who is always a good time. Um, and, you know, he, he has, I say, I'd say in the past couple of years, really, as a lot of us have, really started to think about, like, how is this going to work? How is the next 5, 10, 15, 50 years actually going to work? And what is it that we need to know that we don't already understand? And how are we going to act on that understanding? I mean, one of the things that has always been a mantra, especially when I was at National Geographic, um, was, you know, there's never been a more important or urgent time for us to understand how does the world work and what is our place in it. And I think that this is what this panel is a lot, is like how do we make sure that the ocean thrives so that we can thrive? And I think there's a real connectivity between, you know, there's a, just an essential, essential connection between us and the ocean for air, for food, for anything, for, you know, just the air we breathe, just about everything that is important to us. So I want to quickly have my, my, my panelists introduce themselves with a couple of quick lines so that they can tell us what they're up to, but, and then we'll go to their presentations. Sounds good. Jeff. Um, I'm Jeffrey Marlowe, and I am a postdoctoral scholar of geobiology at Harvard University. Um, I am mostly studying microbial communities in the deep sea that consume methane and kind of thinking about what that means for the planet. Um, I'm also a science journalist, and I am the executive director of the Ad Astra Academy. We work with students around the world to be inspired through exploration to pursue knowledge. OK, so I'm Diva Amon, and I am a deep sea biologist who hails from the Caribbean. Um, and I'm also a Marie, Cl Marie Curie Sklodowska Fellow at the Natural History Museum in London, quite a mouthful. Um, and there my research focuses on trying to answer two questions, what lives in our deep oceans and then how are we impacting it? I'm also the co-founder of a marine NGO nonprofit in the Caribbean um, called Species and we focus on marine education, advocacy and research. Johnson. Hi everyone, I'm John Mandelman. I am the Chief Scientist and Vice President of the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. Uh, the Anderson Cabot Center represents all of our research and conservation work. Uh, at the aquarium. Um, I've been at the aquarium for almost 20 years. Uh, I started out in the days when I had time to be a scientist uh, as a physiological ecologist, doing mostly fisheries biology and fisheries science to try to provide essential information to better manage and inform policy and uh, regulatory decisions in our oceans. And I'm really a fishy guy. I uh, started out studying sharks and fish, and um, that's still sort of my bread and butter. But now I'm in charge of a large center of around 40 people all trying to come up with creative solutions to the biggest oceans, ocean problems. Hello, everyone. I don't think these are on. No, I don't think so either. My name is Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. I am a marine biologist by training. Um, and I've spent the last decade working with Caribbean communities trying to solve this crazy puzzle of ocean conservation by integrating science and policy and communication and economics um, to figure out what the future could look like. And I am founder and president of Ocean Collective, which is a consulting firm for ocean conservation strategy that's grounded in social justice. Great. All right, I guess mine is the only, I should have passed you all my one. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, so what we'll do is go through everyone's presentations, but as you can tell, it's really, it's a, it's, it's a good bunch of people here. So I think we have Jeff's queued. You guys can go ahead and play it. Okay, I can take maybe the functioning microphone. All right, um, so I'm a microbiologist, and I'm mostly interested in thinking about how these microbial communities shape our planet. Microbes are everywhere. Um, they're in any drop of seawater, there are more than a million different organisms. New species are discovered every single day. And they really form the foundation of what we might term a healthy and thriving ocean in this context. They transform different nutrients, they recycle different essential cofactors, um, they change the chemistry around them in a way that makes things habitable for the rest of us. They're really the foundation of any ecosystem, and the ocean in particular. And like the foundation of a building, we need to understand exactly how they work, um, how stable they are, how they 
discuss and communicate amongst themselves in order to really be a sustainable, thriving community. So to illustrate that point, I'm going to ask you a question about these two pictures. Um, which one kind of evokes thoughts of biodiversity more? On the left, we have a picture of the Amazon rainforest. There are probably several hundred species of plants we're seeing in this picture. It's kind of the epitome of a lush, um, diverse ecosystem. On the right, 100,000 times smaller in scale is a grain of sand from the North Sea. And every single green dot you see is a different microbe. There are 8,000 different species on the single grain of sand. So what does this mean in terms of biodiversity and sort of maintaining a thriving ecosystem? Well, like anything that is a fundamental trait of our world, there are a lot of different definitions for biodiversity. The one I'm using here is from the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. And they would use this definition that it's the variability among living organisms from all sources, including, among others, terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, ecological complexes of which they are part. The operative word here, to me, is variability. And the functional, most fundamental unit of biological variability to me is a gene product, gene variation. Genes that make proteins are the functional unit of biology. They're the things that allow us to transform sunlight into food or a toxic chemical into a harmless one. These are the units that change the world biochemically and are important in terms of biodiversity. So where is all of that biodiversity potentially coming from? Here are some estimates about the number of species and gene products that exist. So a recent study suggested there are a trillion different species of microbes and 85 million macroscopic organisms, the plants and animals we see around us all the time. And while there are certainly more genes inside a macroscopic organism, the sheer number of microbes means that about three orders of magnitude, a thousand times more protein-forming genes are found in the microbial world. To put that in context, if this square here on the right is the kind of quantity of gene products from plants and animals, this entire slide is what's coming out of the microbial world. And this is kind of where the deep ocean comes into play. Where are we going to find these new gene products and these crazy environmental systems that allow diversity to thrive? This is the Guaymas Basin in the Gulf of California. It's a heavily sedimented hydrothermal system. And these interactions between different types of chemistry really allow for multiple energetic niches to form. And these are the types of environments that allow a huge diversity of microbes to exist. Of those one trillion potential species, we've characterized or at least seen genetic snippets of only 10 million. So there are 99.999% of the microbial diversity still out there waiting to be discovered. And if we think about where to target that search, I like to think of the Earth as a battery and the deep ocean as a sort of discharging battery, where these chemically reduced energy, electron rich fluids from the interior of the Earth are coming into contact with this sort of oxidized electron poor ocean. This is where um, energy is produced by chemistry rather than by light. So these are chemosynthetic habitats. And there are three broad flavors of these that exist. There are the um, hydrothermal vents that precipitate uh, black minerals as they spew metals into the ocean. There are hydrocarbon seeps. Uh, that's where I've done most of my work. And this is where methane is fueling these symbiotic relationships of microbes that build carbonate rocks. And then these lost city type alkaline hydrothermal vents, which are getting a lot of attention as potential incubators for the origin of life. And those three types of chemosynthetic habitats, you know, there are hundreds, probably thousands of those different vents um, and seeps and mixture of fluids around the world. But in the deep sea, we've only seen about 0.01% of the seafloor. So if that much amazing biological diversity that has changed our conception of what biology is capable of, if we've only seen that in that tiny fraction, it's amazing to me to think about what's in that 99.99% we haven't seen. So the question I'm kind of charging the audience with today is how to focus that search. How do we go from this regional scale sense of an ocean, maybe looking at bubble plumes, zooming in to perhaps get a visual survey, 
taking a chunk of sediment to look at the way that these minerals interact, looking at microbes and minerals on a micro scale. We're crossing 12 different orders of magnitude here. So zooming in on this is hard. And what kind of proxies of metabolic diversity can we look for at a larger scale to zoom in on what's really interesting? So to back up, to me the big picture again is what is all of the unknown metabolic diversity in the microbial world? What are they doing? And how are they building this important foundation for the rest of the biosphere? On the most fundamental level, what are the metabolic reactions we haven't even imagined yet that still exist? And in a more applied sense, how can we use some of these gene products um, perhaps for biotech purposes or for health purposes? So to me, it's really the microbial world that is underlying a thriving ocean. And I look forward to hearing other people's thoughts of how these can integrate to kind of preserve a, a healthy, healthy ocean. Thanks. Let's do a sure. yeah. I feel like I might have to ditch the notes. OK. Do I have a thumbs up? Yes? OK, so Jeff does deep sea stuff, as do I. Jeff tends to look at the really, really tiny things, whereas I'm a couple order magnitudes bigger. I do the megafauna, which are the really charismatic animals that we can see in images and video. Um, so I was saying my research tends to focus on two questions. What lives in our deep oceans, and how are we impacting it? And so we're here today to think about how our oceans exist and how we continue to keep them thriving. Okay. Am I not loud enough? Okay. Um, so, hold on. Let's do a little shuffle room. Right. So, where we need to start is that most of our deep ocean, most of our oceans are actually deeper than 200 meters. That's all of the blue on this map. Over 60% of our planet's surface is deep sea, and that's 98% of all habitable space on our planet. That's the largest ecosystem by far. And with this large size comes great responsibility. Our deep sea provides us with ecosystem services that are essential to keeping our planet healthy and to keeping us alive. So, it sequesters carbon, it regulates climate, and it cycles nutrients. And now, more than ever, our deep sea is becoming a source of food, oil and gas, and many other key resources that we need to survive as stocks are dwindling in shallow waters and in, on land. Sorry. So, as I said, oil and gas, food, well, we can't see food in that picture, but food and even genetic materials are currently being harvested from our deep seas with things like mining for minerals due to begin imminently. And these are polymetallic nodules you can see here in this top image, which contain a lot of metals. So in addition to this, we've also got climate change and pervasive pollution as key impacts in our deep seas. And these anthropogenic impacts are already impacting the communities and habitats and even the basic functioning of our deep sea. And this is only going to become more exacerbated as time goes on. And that would be fine if the story ended there, but it doesn't. Unfortunately, there are two further compounding issues. Firstly, most of our deep sea, as Jeff was saying, is unexplored. More than, most of our deep sea floor has probably been mapped at a resolution of about five kilometers, and that's not really a lot. That means that whole mountains are missing from the story. Furthermore, mapping is just sort of a, a peak of what actually exists down there. And in order to be able to you know, really understand, we need to go down there. We need to explore. And by explore, I mean visualize. So 99%, over 99%, as Jeff said, is unexplored, has never been visualized. And that's just an absolutely staggering figure. That means that we can't even answer basic questions. Questions like, what lives there? Much less questions about the ecology of many of the animals down there. You know, what do they eat? How do they reproduce? Uh, how do, what, is the, what role do they play in this ecosystem? And the second problem is that most of our deep seas are unregulated. And that's because they fall into areas beyond national jurisdiction, which is all of the blue on this map. And that basically means international waters. It means that our deep seas are sort of a, you know, this wild, wild west, essentially, um, where protection and management and governance don't really exist. And that means that a lot of the biodiversity there is left really vulnerable. So 
I said we already have you know, fishing that has sort of rampaged the high seas over the last century, as well as many other impacts just increasing as time goes on. One of the biggest looming impacts right now is deep sea mining. And so these colorful blocks here that you can see are actually areas that have already been leased for exploration for deep sea mining to begin soon. And that's done by the International Seabed Authority, which is an intergovernmental organization responsible for all mineral-related activities in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so in terms of the grand scale of things, this may not seem that big. But when you think each of those 26 areas are tens of thousands of square kilometers and bigger than countries, and that the potential resource is so much greater, we have a ticking time bomb on our hands. So, and this is only one of the types of potential exploitation that can happen in the deep sea in the future. But it's not all bad news. You know, the deep sea, everywhere we've looked and the little that we've explored has continued to absolutely astound us. We have made the most wondrous discoveries, new species like the jelly and the carnivorous sponge we were just seeing, to new habitats, pillow lavas, uh, hydrothermal vents that are absolutely bursting with life and gushing black fluid, underwater lakes, coral beds, who, you, you name it, and we found it. And the deep sea just continues to really push our boundaries, to break down those paradigms of life, and as I said, just be generally pretty amazing. But life in the deep sea is very difficult. For a lot of the animals living down there, they grow really slowly and reproduce even slower. And so that means that they're incredibly vulnerable to change, which is, of course, increasing. Things like this, this basket star and the crinoid we're about to see, there is so little that we know about them. We know some tube worms can live for hundreds of years, some corals for thousands, but we have no idea for the majority of the biodiversity in the deep sea. Who knows what else is left out there to, dis to discover? I mean, I think there's probably quite a lot. Um, and what we can say for sure is that whatever we do find in the future will be equal measures of both really weird and really wonderful. So how do we ensure that our oceans continue to thrive for generations to come? Of course, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, but what we do know is that our deep seas need to play a really integral role. And I think there are a couple of approaches we can take to begin with. So firstly, we need to explore and collect baseline data. We cannot protect what we do not know, and we cannot manage what we do not understand. Next, to be able to do that, we need to innovate. Deep sea research and exploration is difficult, costly, and time consuming. And given the amount of work we have to do, we have to change that. We also need to raise awareness and engage stakeholders. The deep sea is currently out of sight, out of mind. And again, that needs to change. We need to increase our governance. We need to make sure our high seas, our international waters, are governed in a way that is fair and equal, and also in a way that ensures that the resources there will be sustained for generations to come. And if we can't get all of that environmental data that we need to make really sound decisions about management before exploitation begins, then we need to take the precautionary approach. And so that means following this hierarchy here. And it shows that avoiding and preventing impacts should be the first priority. We need to know, we need to make sure, sorry, that when we go into our deep oceans, we go there to appreciate it rather than to plunder it because our oceans will not continue to thrive unless our deep oceans do. Thank you. Trust my mic, all right. Thank you, everybody. And it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, I definitely want to thank uh, Joey and Alex as well as Katie for putting this on, and uh, also my colleague Jane Wolfson at the aquarium, wherever she is, um, back there. Hi, Jane. Um, for allowing the introduction or the involvement in the New England Aquarium in this amazing event, and um, for my involvement. So I th thank you very much. So the thriving ocean. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about where I feel the social side comes in. Um, there are a lot of amazing people, some heroes of mine at this meeting today who are doing just amazing exploratory work. And I think what, what Diva said really resonates as far as we cannot protect what we don't understand. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But I think in terms of actually 
enacting change and driving solutions on the ocean. Um, we have to combine all the technological innovations and the amazing science that goes on and ensure it's maximally applied. So as I mentioned during the introduction, um, my role in leading the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, um, we, are, we believe very strongly in using science to drive solutions, transforming science into action. Um, we combine scientific uh, solutions to different problems or scientific ideas with uh, building extensive partnerships and collaborations and the convening power of the aquarium to drive change. My background as a scientist and being a field biologist, I believe very heavily that we cannot, again, to, to talk to what Diva said, um, I believe very strongly that we cannot protect what we don't understand. So my entire career has been based on trying to identify the areas of, of need, um, trying to figure out the, or evaluate the data gaps, and then going out there and trying to diagnose the problems, fill those data gaps, and come up with the solutions necessary, but not stopping there ensuring that that science and that information is transmitted to the end users that are gonna put it to use. What challenges us? Um, as Bob Ballard said during, during his keynote um, so eloquently, um, we've got a lot of challenges out there and we haven't necessarily done a great job to this point. Climate change is obviously a major problem challenging our oceans. Right here in our backyard in the Gulf of Maine, um, the rates of thermal increase are astronomical, relative almost as high as any other place on Earth. Um, we're seeing major shifts in where our fish migrate, where they live, where animals occur. Um, we've got overfishing, obviously, as Diva pointed to, um, being a major problem. We're seeing roughly 50% of all species out there have gone through some level of decline in population in the last 30 years. Um, we're seeing roughly 85% of species in the ocean that are exploited to one level or, or another. And roughly 40% of the animals that are caught in global fisheries every year are incidental catch, bycatch, that has to then be discarded, which is a huge waste as many of those animals die immediately or sometime after they've been thrown back. And then finally, um, we're seeing major industrialization of the oceans. Ocean shipping has increased or tri uh, uh, quadrupled over the last 20 years alone. And... Uh, the governance of our ocean is missing. Um, as Diva pointed out, uh, less than 5% of the Earth's oceans are protected. And even where they are protected, uh, enforcement is very, very thin. So these are big challenges. But that being said, yes, we are playing a game of catch up. There is a changing environment out there and we have to keep up with it. But there is hope. And we have to base everything on solutions. If it's all about doom and gloom and the perilous end to our, our earth and the oceans as they stand, we're not gonna get very far. We have to look at the victories and we have to look at the things that have worked. The protection of habitats, the protection of species, the restoration of certain key species. We've seen a lot of amazing things happen and we've seen the power of collaboration and innovation. And it's all about working together, not to sound cliche, but it is absolutely vital, as I'll get to in a second, that we work together to drive those solutions. It is not as dire as many make it out to be. And the sky is falling is something that gets people's attention, but to drive solution requires building trust, equity, and collaboration, and understanding that gains are possible. So what are those solutions? Well, first of all, it's a marathon, not a race. I think sometimes we're so desperate to enact policy changes or try to drive very um, extensive um, reform that very often we lose sight of the fact that it's the long-term collaborative networks and the building of equity in the developing world and other areas around the world that's going to, to drive change. We need to empathize with others that are gaining from ecosystem services and understand that the livelihoods of them and their families, the food they eat, is based around the ocean. We are all taking from the ocean. We cannot undercut those communities and those people and those industries that rely on the ocean. But at the same time, we have to protect it. So we have to work together to do that. And collaboration is the absolute key to that, as well as empowering people that are on the front lines, people in coastal communities, in the developing world, and ensuring that everybody is involved and that everybody feels a stake, and building the equity so that those countries, those, those populations, those indigenous cultures, and then everybody else around the world are understanding that we have to safeguard this for the long term. Um, and that's absolutely key. So short-term outcomes can sometimes win, 
but in the long term, it's building that collaboration and working together that's going to end up driving the biggest change. So I would just challenge uh, this panel and the entire conference today to think about some key questions. What are the social innovations for environmental justice? Uh, where can we ensure, or what solutions can we drive to ensure that empathy, collaboration, and communication are integral um, to where we're going uh, across the world as far as protecting the oceans and safeguarding the ocean's resources? How can we scale the solutions? The amazing work that everybody here is doing, everybody at this meeting is doing, how is it ultimately going ultimately to make a bigger difference than just the individual footprint that you're working in? And how can we drive these changes to tackle the biggest problems? What are the social innovations? How can we combine technology with social science, uh, socioeconomics, bioeconomics, to end up um, coming up with the solutions we need to for the long term? And I think that there's amazing work being done around the world. Harnessing that and working together is the key. Nobody's going to get it done in a vacuum. Um, so I'm excited to hear what people have to say and, and to learn more about from all of you about where we're going. Thank you. Try this one. Hello. All right. Is that a problem that I did a switcheroo? Okay. <laughs> They're on it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I have some pictures to show you. So when I think of the future of ocean conservation and exploration, I think of these four ideas. Ocean zoning, coastal cities, the need for triage, and the importance of inclusion. Uh, to give you a little context about where I'm coming from, uh, the work that I do now is as founder and president of the Ocean Collective, which is a consulting company for ocean conservation strategies that are grounded in social justice. And I've built an incredible team of 14 experts whose um, experience spans science and policy and political strategy and communications, filmmaking, event planning, big wave surfing, you name it. And the idea is we can come together in these targeted teams to help create solutions for nonprofits and corporations and philanthropists who are trying to figure out how to improve ocean health. And this importance of building these robust multidisciplinary teams was really solidified for me in my last position. I was executive director of the Waite Institute and I was working in Barbuda, an island in the Caribbean, trying to help that community and government figure out what it would look like to create a truly comprehensive and science-based plan for long-term sustainable ocean use. So in Barbuda, this is what it looked like to do ocean zoning. There were three major drafts of the map, starting with this first one uh, that the government put out there as a straw man, which the fishermen hated. Um, the fishermen came up with this second draft, um, which they thought was more reasonable. The blue are no-take uh, marine reserves. And they added these uh, anchoring and mooring zones in green. And the, by the final draft, which incorporates feedback from the full breadth of the stakeholders, we had this detailed and very interesting uh, zoning. But what does it actually look like to do this work? This took 18 months. There were seven rounds of community consultations. There were two additional rounds specifically with fishermen. There were 22 meetings with the local government, tons of coordination with the central government in Antigua. But this is what the daily work looked like. You'll notice Shaw Selby <laughs> in the center of that photo there. This is um, fishermen, a, f a marine park ranger, an immigrations officer, um, a technologist, a GIS expert, and me sitting around the table. I, we've interrupted a dominoes game. These folks wouldn't come to the community consultations, and we really wanted to get their input. And so for me, when I think about the role of technology, I think about it in this context. How do we use technology to bridge the gap between people and their ideas and their communities and their cultures and solutions that will actually work in this context? So on this little laptop, we have um, 
satellite images that have been refined into habitat maps and we're able to give real-time feedback into their different ideas of what zones could be put into place to tell them how that would affect um, their fishing grounds and, and what percentage of habitats would be protected by their proposals. And this is what that final map looked like in more detail after 18 months. So the blue areas are marine reserves. That represents one third of their coastal waters out to uh, three nautical miles from shore. Um, within those protected areas, one third of each habitat type is protected. So seagrasses, um, reefs, sandy bottoms, and deep ocean. The green is anchoring and mooring zones, which are designated in sandy areas so as not to hurt bottom habitat, and also designated primarily so they can limit where boats are anchoring and use that as, a, as an initial framework to collect fees from visiting vessels. The pink is areas where no nets are allowed. The fishermen thought it was really important to prevent the use of nets on reefs. So this is no nets within 20 meters of the reefs and in other areas where there's high traffic. Um, you'll also note that the marine protected area on the southern end doesn't go all the way to shore, and that's because there's a really important cultural use there. People go camping there um, in the spring with their families around Easter time, um, and they fish there to eat while they're camping. And so creating a marine reserve that extended all the way to shore there would have had some really serious impacts on their tradition. And then the last you'll notice is the shipping zone. We don't want you know, people swimming or fishing in, in these high traffic areas. So for this community of 1,600 people on a small island, this is what zoning they created. Um, all of these lines were drawn by the local people and we used technology um, and a lot of, sort of patient conversations to help facilitate that. But obviously, conservation efforts are not just important in remote tropical islands. It's with uh, you know, eight billion people on the planet and soon the majority of us living on the coast and in cities, it's really time to figure out urban ocean conservation. So this is New York City. I grew up in Brooklyn and I never thought of myself as living on the coast, but New York has over 500 miles of coastline. Um, and so it's really important to me that when we think about exploration, we're not just thinking about the deep sea, but how can we use these ROVs and drop cams and all this other technology to help connect people who live in cities on the coast with their ocean, which they are very disconnected with. Um, so I've just recently moved back to New York and I'm very excited to, to be thinking about ocean conservation in an urban context. We have, as the result of a really sort of long and arduous slog of regulations and improving policy, we've seen that the waters of New York City are actually cleaner now than they've been in 100 years. We have whales coming back to New York Harbor. We have seahorses living under piers in the Hudson River. Um, it actually works when you put in that effort to reduce pollution and establish protections. So I'm really excited about this as one of the next waves of conservation. However, we've done a really good job of impacting um, and destroying a lot of coastal ecosystems, including the, the oyster reefs and the marshes that protect us from things like Hurricane Sandy, which is the moment when we realize that we are a coastal city. And the blue economy of ports and shipping and fishing is worth over $350 billion in the US alone and supports over 3 million jobs. So it is important for a number of reasons to get this right, whether we're caring about the economy or food security or coastal cultures. So given the mess that we humans have gotten ourselves in, I would actually posit that it's time to take a bit of a triage approach because we don't actually have enough money and time to save everything right now. We need to think about a strategy for prioritizing our efforts. So are there places that are not at immediate risk? Are there places desperately in need of immediate attention? And are there things that are beyond help that would be a waste of our energy and um, impede our ability to actually save a greater portion of other things?
This is a really hard discussion to have, but it's one that I think we need to have if we're going to be successful and really maximize um, the, the benefits of and successes of our efforts. And I really don't think we're going to be successful unless we figure out diversity and inclusion. This slide is blank because most of ocean conservation and exploration is very white. <laughs> um, this is a photograph uh, taken earlier this month of the leaders of the International Year of the Reef, which is aiming to protect and restore coral reefs around the world. And this is a bunch of white people, mostly men, mostly middle-aged or older. And I honestly do not think that all of the solutions and ideas are present in this photo. This has nothing to do with touchy-feely um, views about diversity. If we want to be successful, we need to make sure that all the ideas and perspectives are at the table. And you better believe it that the communities that live on the coast on coral reefs have been thinking about these solutions like their lives depend on it because their lives do indeed depend on it. So when we think about the fact that the majority of cor cor coral reefs are in, uh, in Asia, in the Caribbean, on the coast of Africa, which are communities of color, this is really atrocious. So when I think about the future of ocean conservation and exploration, I think it needs to look a lot more like this. And so that's what gives me hope, this idea that we can bring together diverse experts and everyone in this photo is an expert in a different way and have these conversations about how we can each leverage our expertise to come up with solutions that will enable us to continue to use the ocean, to have it support our food security and economies and cultures, but do all of this in a way that doesn't use it up. So that's, that's my vision. Wow, that was great. So I'll start off with a few questions, but you guys think of questions too. And there is the super, there is something fantastic when, I ha when we have questions. I will throw this to you, which is a microphone. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that part. But first, <laughs> I mean, this is such a good set of problems because like I was saying, I mean, I, I'm thrilled to hear all you guys talking about all these different ways because it really is, you know, the, the elephant in the room with all of how we're dealing with the ocean is still really people. How are we gonna make sure that people who are chucking stuff in the ocean all the time are going to see it? And one of the things that I've always thought was difficult for people and the ocean is most of the time the water's in the way. You can't actually see what's in there most of the time. So we, I would just ask you guys, what is it that in each of your different practices, because they're all sort of different, but they're the same, what would you have people see? And I think of that as like a storytelling, but visualizing is so much how humans perceive things. What would you have people see that they can't see, that you have seen, or that you want to see, even if you've never seen it, and could clear all the water out of the way for just a second to see it and understand something big about the ocean? Yeah, I would say that the, um, the you can have okay. this. <laughs> try this thing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, the, the s I'll take this. Okay. Um, I think the like the same issue that is the problem, the fact that there's water in the way and we can't see things, makes it mysterious and exciting, and that sort of quest to you know look beyond the next hill is inherent in that idea of looking, you know, just beyond the headlights of an ROV. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that sort of sense of mystery and excitement um, is something I would try to share. The other thing that I've always struggled with is the kind of intellectual emotional disconnect of microbes. Like they are not charismatic, but they really matter. So how do we image them or portray them or share that how amazing they are, you know, intellectually with a broader audience. And Cartoons. don't have an answer to that, but Cartoons. anthropomorphizing them more, maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they could be animalized more. True. Yes. Yeah. They could so. be plantized. Some of them are plants, some of them are animals. So, yeah. yeah. So that's um, where I'm at, yeah. How about, I mean, what do you, I mean. So growing up in the Caribbean, does this work? 
Maybe. Um, all right. Okay. So growing up in the Caribbean, one of I spent a lot of time at, on on the ocean, and just the exact question you asked, what could we see? I remember being out at sea and wishing that I had some kind of device that would show me what was down there from the day you could just have on the boat, you know, and just be like, oh, there's a squid down there. Oh, th oh there's some dolphins lingering over there. <laughs> I mean, that's me as a kid, but I think that. With the deep ocean, it's especially difficult. I mean, at least in coral reefs and in shallow areas, you can get yourself there and get into that in those environments. But with the deep sea, that's pretty much impossible. But there are a lot of really great programs that are working to, you know, do away with that. You know, things like the Ocean Exploration Trust and NOAA's Office for Ocean Exploration are, are really bringing the deep sea to the masses. And the deep sea, is, as both Jeff and I have spoken about, is just full of such amazing things, things that people just can't even believe are real. And I think that just by increasing that awareness in the population will probably go a very, very long way to helping to sustain it. So I would actually flip that question a little bit and say that we should be seeing more what others see. So instead of us trying to show everybody else, the ocean, I tend to think that the stakeholders that have the biggest impact on the ocean have their own vision and view of the, of the ocean. And then we need to take their perspective into account more. Um, a great example is the cooperative work we do with fisheries here in New England. Um, we work with a lot of commercial fishermen and the industry that we've seen, um, they have their own perspectives. Now, does that mean that they're always right? Not necessarily, but their combined input and stake in the work has actually strengthened immeasurably a lot of the projects that we've done. Um, and that's their own way of looking at the ocean and their, own, and their own perspective. So I think that we need to open our eyes and not get out of our own way once in a while in terms of what we're seeing and think about what others see and let that combined um, viewpoint drive change. Does this work? This is a bummer, okay. <laughs> what if I wanna interject? Um, I think we need more glass bottom boats. When I was five, I um, went on a family vacation to Key West, and I rode on a glass bottom boat, and I saw a coral reef for the first time, and it blew my mind. And that was the moment when I was like, what is it called when it's your job to look through this glass? <laughs> and I was like, I'm clearly going to become a marine biologist. Um, and so I think not everyone needs to become a marine biologist, but this, that moment of experience and awe, and whether it's you know not in clear tropical waters, but you know in New York City, and if you shine a light and things come, and you could do it at night and see different things, I think something that simple could have a really big impact. We can't all go to the deep sea, but again, you know, there's been lots of work around the communications efforts of live feeds of expeditions and all that kind of stuff is great too. But I would honestly love to see more glass bottom boats. There's so few of them in the world. Okay, keep that for a second, and I'm just going to yell. So, so one of the things you mentioned, too, is that idea of that technology has this great way of building bridges or, you know, just bridging gaps between people and, and making that connection. So now I'm doing um, But what, what technologies, to have you guys think about this, or, you know, have you seen do that? Because, you know, we've got, you know, when... You know, Bob has his great telepresence, which is actually like, you know, you can, you know, if you guys haven't looked on the Nautilus online, just check it out because you can see real time and you can ask questions of somebody who's scooting around out in the Pacific or whatever, and that's fantastic. Also, maps of being able to, you know, if you were saying is in real time to get fishermen who might completely live there and see it all the time, but just to see a different view of how this looks and make those great decisions. So, I mean, what, what technologies, here we are at, you know, at Katie's super party, uh, talking, about <laughs> <laughs> at talking about the tech, but what, is the, what are the technological things that you see connecting, again, connecting people to their ocean that are interesting? Are, are boats technology? I, can I use my same answer? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I actually, um, as a consultant, one of my clients in the last year has been XPRIZE. And I helped them design a, um, a, a competition to develop apps uh, using existing ocean data sets. So we have tons of data about the ocean. Lots of it is from NOAA, lots from other you know, research institutions. And a lot of it is actually already public. And yet 
that data isn't accessible or visualizable to the public. And so I designed this competition for them that enabled, the idea was to sort of unlock all the data we already have. Um, obviously a new exploration is still fascinating and wonderful, but we already know so much that's not being conveyed. And so um, I would encourage you all to check out the winners of this big ocean button challenge. Um, there are seven winners, and one of them actually is an app that you can hold up when you're on the shoreline and see the bottom topography, at least of the ocean. You can't see what's swimming there right at that moment, but you can kind of start to get a glimpse into um, into the bathymetry and, and start to visualize that there actually is uh, some, you know, some complexity beneath the surface. Um, and so those kinds of things, like how can we use the fact that we carry around tiny computers in our pockets to help um, see and explain those kinds of things? Um, one, exa yeah. one example um, that I've seen work well, I think that uh, appreciation really requires being immersed to the best possible degree. And obviously with technology these days, people can do that from their computers or their smartphones, their iPads. Um, but I think the whole advent of, of VR, virtual reality at a, at a low price and accessibility through Google and other networks, the technology is amazing and you really can feel like you're there. And I think that's the closest thing that we can get to bringing everybody out there and immersing them. Obviously in person, um, saturation, so to speak, in the environment is by far the most impactful way to actually be out there and see it with your, with your own eyes. But thanks to technology, there's a lot of new ways to get people out there if that's what you're trying, if that's the button you're trying to push and get people exposed. Mm -hmm. So I, those were both my answers, by the way. Thanks, Jenny, as well. <laughs> but um, no, I do think there is immersing people in the environment is the main way to do that. Everyone is visual mm -hmm. and being able to actually see you know, an, an entire world that you can't really visualize normally has huge steps towards getting people to want to conserve it. And so, for instance, in deep sea science, you know, things like VR technology are sort of the future. It, you know, telepresence takes us down there, but then actually being able to feel like you're down there is just one further step, which mm -hmm. is absolutely fantastic. And we're just on the cusp of, of getting that, you know, into people's homes and, and mainstreaming. Yeah, so I would absolutely agree with all of that, but I might also push back and make a case for the, the tangible a little bit more. When we um, you know, work with kids who maybe never been to the ocean before, or realize that there are other planets or something like that, um, as part of our education program, we have an opportunity for them to take pictures of Mars and work with NASA to actually get new images from a different planet, which is, sounds so cool. Another part of the curriculum is that we go to the coast and look at water under a microscope. And for probably more than half the students, that's actually more impactful. It's just like seeing a new world in something that is, seems so quotidian and realizing that there is a whole thing beyond what you actually see, but making it, you know, connecting the dots and it's not just something on a screen still, right. regardless of how far away it is, but it's, it's right there. But that's, that's the thing. I mean, I think I can talk about it. <laughs> but that's the thing is we're talking about connecting the dots for, again, for humans because they are the ones that have to take care of it. But again, this idea of connecting people also to how they, what is their place in all of this too? Not just to look at it like, oh, Blue Planet, I watched on TV, it was great, but it's not necessarily relevant. You know, I think that the idea of you know, making, again, whether it's coastal communities, whether it's people who are, you know, buying fish or something, you know, that idea of making people also feel that they're empowered, you know, at the very closest level, but then at the bigger level, you know, at a everyday level, even if you do live in Wichita, you know, home of all the marine biologists. Mm -hmm. But um, how can we, how, what is, if you, if you guys could sort of wave a magic wand, there are a huge bunch of challenges facing us, but what would be a way to make sure that, you know, have a solution that we could scale up? I mean, this is um, kind of, there's, 
I'm staggered by the, by the enormity of the problem in a certain way, and I'm sure you guys often are too. But the idea of just trying to figure out what would be the technological solutions or policy solutions, some of these things are absolutely policy, whether or not we actually can um, protect the high seas is totally a policy thing, whether or not, I mean, I think that your solutions on you know, coming up with speaking to each individual community and coming up with solutions is certainly the best one to start with, is, you know, ground up. Um, but if you could empower those people with technological solutions, what else would it be that would connect, you know, that would create these big solutions that could, um, it, would it, you know, aquaculture? Is it aquaculture that will actually connect us and save us, or is it, it understanding? the problem you're trying to solve. Right? Yes. Like, all of these things are very different that you're describing. So aquaculture, we really need to figure out because we can't feed 8 billion people on wild seafood. The ocean just can't keep up with yeah. how, much, how fast we can eat fish. So the technology that's needed there is super important for food security, um, whereas the technology that's needed to support uh, you know, zoning and policy making is quite different than the technology needed to uh, monitor fishing. And there's yep. some really great innovations there with lower cost VMS and, and satellite tracking and all of that kind of stuff. So I think, I, mean, I think we need to be careful not to think of technology as the yes. solution, but to be more targeted. Like what is the specific problem we're needing to solve? And is technology needed to solve that problem and if so like what specific technologies because i i worry about the mindset that like we can innovate our way out of problems where a lot of problems really just we need to agree with each other and the technology is a tool so i would echo what john said earlier which is we need to be talking about what's working and replicating and scaling success stories. I think that um, that is a missing link. And to the extent that technology can help spread the word about these stories of ocean optimism, check out that hashtag online. You'll find lots of what's working. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that uh, would be really valuable. Yeah, I agree. And I, just to add to that, I think mobilizing the public and creating awareness in the public is not always the right Right. Solution. Um, it's not always going to pull the lever that you need to. It's not the end all be all answer to problems. Sometimes problems are very individualistic around different, a few different stakeholder groups that need to work together to drive change. So I'm not opposed to um, awareness of the oceans um, and, and promoting that awareness, but when it's pragmatic and when it's done in a way that's actually going to create the empowerment that we were just talking about. And ensure that people's behaviors are changed. Um, but that's not always the right solution. It's yeah. really case dependent. It depends on the question. Absolutely. The issue. Yeah. Um, but I love to cite the example of, of what's happened with shark fins um, over in, in Asia. Um, recently, in, in recent years, there's been major initiatives to try to address what is driving the fin trade globally. It's not trying to cut off the supply, but actually working sensitively with the indigenous populations there to understand the depth of the problem that's caused by this particular demand. And I think once that awareness has spread and at the demand side sensitively working together, you're starting to see a reduction in the value of those fins. Yeah. And that trend still has a lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But that's an incredible way of sensitive communication that isn't saying what you're doing is bad, but here's what the effects of what you're doing. And it's incredible what kind of a change that can draw when you bring in the people and involve them. Yeah. So we only have a few more. I mean, go ahead quickly. No, and then we have a few. We have one more minute for questions. Oh. One quick question. One, does anybody have a question? A burning <laughs> question that they have. You can throw that one. <laughs> yeah. One burning question you guys have that you would like an answer to. Um, I want to know how we can better incorporate art into these solutions because I think if we're going to have the cultural shift on a massive scale that we need, it has to be appealing and attractive and sexy and beautiful. And so 
that's what we need to figure out. How, uh, where are, you know, what's the next generation of movies and art and sculpture and design that's going to inspire everybody to commit to this really hard and complicated work for the long term? Sorry, I just have to talk into this for one second. Um, <laughs> so I think to find the subsidies to help offset the cost of changing strategies for people that are very accustomed to doing things a certain way, but new technologies are coming in that might allow them to keep doing that and then at the same time not have the impact on the ocean, that's often very, very costly. Mm -hmm. And I think finding a way to get that money, sounds, uh, it sounds really cheesy, but it, there needs to be more funding that is um, directed towards pushing these changes once they're engineered. I just want to find out what lives in our oceans, goddammit. <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's, I, I think that's one of the biggest questions is, again, you need to find out what's there before you can understand how to manage it. And I think increases in technology and, and working with technologists and to actually be able to answer that question is sort of that burning issue. Yes, I would certainly echo that. And also, I mean, we were talking last night that there was a study last year where they found these, these <laughs> copepods in the Mariana Trench, like the deepest most unexplored part of the ocean and they had PCBs, they're full of PCBs. So the fact that our tendrils of um, contamination are outpacing our initial characterization of places is a problem. On the social side, I think, you know, how we, how the ideas of wilderness and urban life coexist is really interesting and your presentation made me wonder about that. To me, it's, you know, escaping civilization to go to the wild, but because we live with and in nature, we need to think more about that. That sounds great. <laughs> Oyster watching. All right, great. This is so good, you guys. I mean, seek these people out and ask them more questions later. But we are good. But thank you, everybody. If anyone wants to ask questions on Twitter, I'm volunteering myself and Diva and Jeff, and Jeff <laughs> to answer your questions if people are watching online. And we're using hashtag open ocean. Good. We hashtag open ocean. So <laughs> great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's a very exciting time for sensors and uh, the environment in general, especially oceans, right? As, as Bob said in that great keynote, uh, there's so much that we haven't seen. Uh, and it may not be human eyes that directly see all of it. It's great to be. Because we, uh, we can scale in other ways through electronics and networks and things like that. So uh, this is a great time to think about new kinds of sensors for the ocean. At this point, we're deploying Internet of Things scale sensors across the, the planet in our habitated environments. We're going to see that happen in natural environments. And indeed, we'll see it happen in the oceans. And new technologies are really revolutionizing how we're able to sense things, what we're able to sense, and how we connect it to people. So it's, it's a great time. Uh, I run the Responsive Environments Group here at the, the Media Lab. So I've been doing sensing most of my life. I even spent uh, four or five years at Draper Lab doing underwater sensing, too. So <laughs> I guess I have a slight privilege to be here with these honest, honored guests. But you know, I've done a little bit of it. And I think it's, again, a very exciting time going forward when all this comes together. So we got a great panel to discuss this. We're going to open up with statements from the panelists. Uh, they'll give a short talk, and then we'll have Q&A from the audience and among ourselves. Um, so we're going to begin with uh, Alan Leonardi from NOAA, and then Anna Michelle uh, from Woods Hole, and finally uh, uh, Brennan Phillips from uh, URI, URI. So maybe you guys can uh, introduce yourselves and, and we can start. Sure, thanks. Uh, Alan Leonardi, I'm the director of NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, and also a member of the Science Advisory Board for the Ocean Mapping X Prize. I'm Anna Michelle. I'm an associate scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and a proud MIT alum, so I'm happy to be back on campus. And I'm Brennan Phillips. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in ocean engineering at the University of Rhode Island. Okay, great. So maybe we can start with uh, your, uh, your talks. Uh, we'll begin with Alan. Sure. Great. Um, let me get out of the way a little bit. Uh, let me say one thing to get, to get us going. I was a little bit surprised, uh, and maybe this is a good thing, that when I looked at the agenda, I am the only speaker here from the federal government. Uh, so I, I'm proud to say that I'm, I'm here from the government, <laughs> and we need each other's help. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about what our office does so we can talk about some, get to the sensors and systems part of the conversation. I believe strongly that the, the best part of any of these things is dialogue, uh, so I'll try to get through, through this pretty quickly. We'll start with the, uh, the obligatory statement about who we are. 
we, we are a pretty unique federal entity. We are the only office within the, within the entire federal government that focuses solely on exploring the ocean. Uh, we are not a big entity by any stretch of the means, um, but we have great partnerships that we work with along the way to try to stretch our boundaries of what we do. And the reason why we focus on exploring the ocean, quite frankly, is because all of humanity requires us to. Uh, the keys to the, to the world and the solutions of the world really rest in the oceans. We've, we've heard this morning already some conversation about the many problems that the oceans face, but we also have heard little snippets about the solutions that the ocean provides to all of humanity. They are prim primary protein source for the world. There are next generation novel therapeutics. If you're looking for drug discovery, this is the place to go. Uh, and of course, we all love to live and play uh, near the ocean as well. So uh, our purpose is exploration, and we believe firmly that exploration leads to discovery. That discovery then leads to follow-on research. That research leads to understanding that ocean environment, and ideally our understanding of that ocean environment leads to the fundamental wise use of that space. Uh, we fulfill our purpose in a number of ways. We have multi-year partnerships. We have major campaigns that you undertake. We'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we partner with entities such as the Ocean Exploration Trust. You've already heard from Bob Ballard uh, this morning. Um, we use things like something called the National Oceanographic Partnership Program, which allows for public-private partnerships uh, within the ocean space. And of course, we focus heavily on data sharing, outreach, and education as well. Our primary asset that we can use for exploring the ocean is a vessel called the NOAA Ship Oceanic Explorer. Uh, it's dedicated. It is the only U.S. federal vessel that's dedicated to the, uh, the mission of exploring the ocean. Uh, there's some details here about any number of the assets that are on that. Uh, the one that most people are uh, most familiar with are, is the asset. Here's the ship itself. There's the asset on the back deck that you'll see uh, in another picture, this remotely operated vehicle. It's a two-bodied system, much like the Ocean Exploration Trust's vessel, which uh, will, will show up in a, in a moment as well. To give you a sense of the magnitude of what we've been doing, this is the last three years of our work. The office has been in existence since 2001. We've had a vessel since 2008. And over the last three years, we've spent uh, exploring the Pacific uh, uh, communities and for the first time, going to every managed place that NOAA has responsibility for. If it's a protected area, a monument, or a sanctuary, for the first time, we've gone to these places, looked at the deep ocean environments, and tried to give NOAA a sense of our management responsibilities. After all, you cannot manage what you do not know, and so we've gone here for the first time. Uh, along the way, we've also partnered with folks from the Cook Islands, getting them to see their deep ocean environment for the first time ever. Nobody had ever done any work there before, so we've been doing work with the Cook Islands and others as well. Um, you can look at some of the statistics here. I won't bore you with them, but we mapped a lot of the seafloor. We had a lot of uh, ROV uh, operations and samples collected and things of that nature. And of course, we had a lot of views. We had 8.4 8 million live views on YouTube. One of our key things that we do, just like the uh, Ocean Exploration Trust, is we broadcast what we do live to the public and we interact with scientists who may be unsure and we interact with communities uh, of students and just interested people uh, while we do our work. Moving forward over the next uh, few years, 2018 to 2020, this is a kind of a sneak peek of what we're looking at. These slides are all gonna be made available to you, so if you wanna dig in a little bit, you wanna reach out, you wanna participate, uh, let us know. But we've moved back east of the canal, and we're gonna be focusing in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic uh, through at least 2020, perhaps a little bit longer. We've got a lot of activities already teed up, some in partnership with other government agencies, some in partnership with the academic community, and some in partnership with folks like the Navy. And it, it would not be fair of me to talk about our exploration capabilities without pointing out uh, one of the other major assets that we support. Uh, we, of course, don't operate the Ocean Exploration Trust vessel Nautilus, but we do support it. We, uh, I, I'm proud to say, are the primary benefactor currently of that vessel's operations. Uh, maybe it'll stay that way, but Bob's very entrepreneurial, as everybody knows, and see, so he's always gaining additional resources to do the kind of work that they do as well. Um, this is the Nautilus's plans for this this coming year, so tune in. There's gonna be a lot of great discoveries. Some of this is follow on to the work that we've done. Some of this is some continuing stuff, particularly along uh, the Cascadia margin where there's some really ex extremely exciting event communities. So tune in, there's always good discoveries going on. And, and as Bob likes to point out, 24 by seven operations and lots of interactions with the public and the education community. So it's not sufficient though to just go out there and collect this data and then kind of put it, to, give it to some scientists and put it on the shelf. Our goal is from ship to repository, 90 to 120 days, 
for all of the data that we collect. And it becomes publicly available. Anybody who wants to use it can. The BATHI data is, generally speaking, within 60 days. The biological samples go to uh, the Smithsonian. Some of them are in the Bishop Museum for the communities in the Pacific. And right now, we've been sending some uh, sub-samples to the Ocean Genome Legacy Center as well to try to increase the ocean genome. All of that data is publicly available. All of those samples are publicly available. Anybody in the science community who wants to use them can. Uh, and then we also focus uh, heavily on public engagement. We've got a strong web presence. Of course, we, tele we telecast live what we do. But we also have a teacher ed uh, educational professional development program where we, like the Nautilus folks, uh, develop lesson plans. We get the teacher community together. We teach them how to best use those lesson plans. And then they use them in the middle school and the high school setting. Because after all, the key is the key to the future of the ocean problems and the ocean solutions of tomorrow are the middle schoolers and the high schoolers of today. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, and we'll hand it over to the, to the next speakers in the way, but I look forward to the Q&A and, uh, and talking about how we can augment what we're doing with these existing platforms that I showed and some of the things that might be coming online uh, in the coming years. Thank you. <laughs> Anna is next. So I'm Anna Michelle, and I'm a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And we're going to turn now to a little bit deeper into the sensing side. So my lab works on developing new sensors for, for making chemical measurements in the ocean. So I'm going to show you some of the technology we've been developing. And then I'm going to end with some of the big problems we have. And this is where I really hope we can have some conversation later on how do we get new technologies into the ocean, because some of our platforms are, or some of our instruments are still very big. And so how do we move from these giant instruments to these small, cheap sensors? I know, Alan, has, and I have had many conversations about this. So I do a lot of gas sensing in my lab, and I'm sure all of you have heard about how carbon dioxide, so this is the blue line, has gone up over time, and so people want to make measurements of carbon dioxide. There's another gas that's equally important, um, perhaps even more important that you've probably heard about, methane. So this is time versus concentration, and so this is methane going up over time. So methane's gone up, and why do we care about it? Well, there's a big <coughs> influence on climate. So these two gases are really important in the ocean, and so we want to be able to measure them in lots of different environments. But one of the problems is they're often from these diffuse sources. So how do we actually make measurements in these different environments of these gases? And also, if they're in the gas form and the ocean is, it was liquid, how do we actually make measurements of them? And where do we want to make measurements of them? So if we look at the ocean as a whole, there's lots of environments where these um, gases are really important. And so if we step through some of these environments where we want to put these sensors out, um, up in the Arctic, there's areas, the coastal areas, um, also these lakes and um, coastal areas where there's a lot of methane coming up. We want to be able to make measurements there. Um, Alan just me mentioned the Cascadia margin. There's a lot of methane bubbles that come up in those areas where we want to be able to put instruments out to make those kind of measurements. Um, in coastal areas, like estuaries, um, there's a lot of methane that comes out there. So how do we measure, make measurements in those environments? Um, at seeps, these cold seeps in the deep ocean, um, hydrothermal events have a lot of these different gases, so how do we make measurements there? Um, bubbles that come out, either they could be carbon dioxide bubbles or they could be methane, like in Cas Cascadia margin. Um, and there's also these methane hydrates in the deep ocean. So how do we actually get instruments that we can take out and make measurements in these environments instead of actually collecting a sample and bringing them back on the ship and then bringing them back to our lab and maybe six months later we have a measurement? We want to make measurements at these sources. So my lab works on this technique called laser absorption spectroscopy. And I'm going to simplify this, but basically we have a laser and we have a detector. The laser puts out light and we collect that light. What we do is we pick the laser light to be at a certain wavelength. And it's the same wavelength that whatever we want to measure absorbs light. So as that light goes through our sample, we see a decrease in the amount of light. And then we can determine what's actually in our sample. So we can do this for a bunch of different gases. This is a, a picture here of the different wavelengths and different gases. So methane um, is this red gas over here. So the stronger these lines are, the more light we can actually absorb in that region. So what you can notice here, there's a lot of different gases that are important in the ocean that have this infrared signature. So methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, lots of different gases that we can use these techniques for. So it's a really good um, technique to use for atmospheric sensing, but also for ocean sensing. 
One of the problems is, though, these lasers won't go through water. So what we actually have to do is extract our gases. So we have to build systems to actually get the gas out of our seawater, and then we can measure that gas. So that brings in a new challenge to be able to bring these technologies to ocean environments. So what have we done? We built these systems to be able to make measurements coming out of surface water, so out of things like lakes and coastal regions. What we can do is we can launch this laser a really long distance over the water, and any gas that's coming out of the water, we can measure. What we do is we use these really cool lasers, these quantum cascade lasers. Each one of these stripes is actually a laser, so they're really small. So the idea of using these small lasers is we can make these small sensors. But there's a lot of electronics involved, so our sensors end up being really big for other reasons. So even though our lasers have become really small and our detectors have become really small, there's a lot of other challenges that we need to address, like how do you make the electronics themselves smaller? How do you make the power packs smaller? For example, the batteries. So another thing we do is we try to make measurements in these coastal regions. And so what we've done, we can use the same kind of technology and we can buy these commercially packaged to take out in the field, and we can put them into an autonomous kayak. So this is a kayak that we can put all these different instruments on and drive around. So here's the kayak driving around. Um, this is actually about an hour away from here. What we can do is kind of like a remote control car. We can drive it along. As it drives along, it can continuously make measurements of the chemistry in the surface waters. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of applications for this, both in the coastal, and we're going to take this out actually to Cascadia Margin this fall to make measurements of methane coming up on the surface waters. So what does it give us? This is actually a map. So this is a, a river here. This is the longitude and latitude. And what it can do is as we drive the jet yak up and down, it can continuously make these measurements. And so we can get, start getting these large spatial scale measurements that can tell us what's happening in the water. This is actually methane here. And when you see it turn red, this is actually a plume of methane that's being emitted here. Um, there's actually a wastewater treatment plant here, so it's putting out um, a plume right here. And so over time, we can start to track it. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of different applications where we could have these autonomous vehicles that we could drive around and start making um, better spatial scale measurements. Uh, third, um, this is a project um, with Pete Gerges, who some of you saw this morning. Um, this has developed systems where we can do these kind of measurements in the deep ocean. So this is the first generation system here that we can put out in the deep ocean. We can put it on a vehicle like Hercules, and we can make measurements of carbon dioxide and methane in the deep ocean. Um, we've been developing a new system. This is our new system here, which is a lot smaller, but it's still very complicated. So you can see the system here is packaged in our pressure housing being put in Hercules, and you can immediately see what one of the problems is. It takes two people to just lift that instrument. I can't even lift it myself because the pressure housings are so big because the instruments are big. So where are we with chemical sensing and where do we want to go? Well, we're limited right now because the instruments are large, they're heavy, a lot of them require a lot of power, so they're platform limited. We can't put these instruments on AUVs right now. We have to be on a vehicle like Hercules. But they're also one of a kind. There's one of each of these different instruments. They're also highly technical, so we need somebody specialized in the instrument to be able to deploy it. Also, funding is a problem. It's, it's not easy, but it, you can get funding to develop a first generation system, but how do you get money to take that system into many different generations? How do you push that instrument further? So what do we want? We want small, easy to use sensors that we can put on lots of different platforms. We also want to look at new technologies. There's a lot of labs that are developing technologies for other applications, such as biomedical applications, that we could really transition to ocean applications. So what new technologies are available that we could look for? I'm also personally really interested in doing plume hunting and tracking. So when we put AUVs down, for example, can we put an instrument on it that can find these different plumes? Can they find vent fields? Can they find <coughs> bubbles, for example. So how do we move from having an instrument that we know is going to a targeted site to actually using the instruments to find these sites? Thanks. <coughs> okay. Next we have uh, our friend. There we go, great, thanks. Okay, so uh, my name is Brennan Phillips. As I said, I'm an ocean engineer at the University of Rhode Island, but uh, my other alter ego is a deep sea biologist. So today I'll be talking a lot about deep sea biology, how it relates to technology, and sort of the take home theme, it's pretty obvious. You know, you can't explore the deep ocean without knowing your tech. So they're, they're a couple disciplines, they have to work together. 
Um, and with that, um, there's some interesting themes to explore uh, off of that. But the topic of this whole workshop is these be, here, be, here be dragons, and so these are my dragons. When I thought about it, I was like, well, you know, where, what, what are dragons actually look like underwater? Um, and so one of the projects I work on is in the Western Pacific um, on a submarine volcano that's really shallow. Uh, a couple years ago, we were exploring around this area, and this is when it's erupting uh, most of the time, and we actually got inside the crater using a very piece of, low, uh, of, of lightweight technology from National Geographic, and when it's not erupting, it's full of sharks. So just as an example, <laughs> This is out there, but um, you can't take a big ship and sit it out over there. You have to just throw something over the side and see that. Right nearby, there we found this deep sea shark at about 1,800 meters, again, using that lightweight piece of technology. Um, but uh, another theme I work on a lot with um, is hydrothermal vents, which are also underwater volcanoes. Uh, and on uh, the Nautilus and the Hercules ROV, uh, a couple years ago at the Galapagos, uh, we just were able to publish these findings. We found a whole bunch of skate eggs, embryos, that are evidence that these deep sea uh, skates are actually using these vents to incubate themselves and increase their, uh, or decrease the time it takes them to gestate. Another topic I work on is bioluminescence and using low light cameras. So uh, this is a school of flashlight fish out in the Solomon Islands in the Western Pacific. Um, this doesn't do it justice, but to give you some representation of what this school looks like, it's like an order of magnitude more. It's like it's swarming around you. Uh, we're able to film that. Uh, and also using that same type of capability, we're able to film bioluminescence in really high resolution. And recently playing around with a color camera, that same worm you just saw, we can show that it emits a blue bioluminescence and it actually sheds it. So we thought the animal was glowing, but it's actually shedding it, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, another recent trip I was on, this is in one hour of diving, we found evidence of a bioluminescent sponge. You Google Scholar that, you won't find it. Uh, and a bioluminescent black coral. Again, you Google that and you won't find anything. Uh, I can't publish that, that's, you know, it's a, it, we have to actually collect these things, but just flying around in the dark, you find some cool stuff uh, if you just do that. So changing the way we approach it. Um, and lastly, a couple examples. Uh, this is a trip just a few months ago on Nautilus, uh, approaching animals with just some dim lights. And so this is a jellyfish the size of a trash can called Deep Star Enigmatica, uh, and it's totally chilling and doing its thing. We actually caught it capturing something uh, and closing up, and then we can get up really close and kind of do some interesting lighting on it, um, sort of like you know interior lighting to show these canals that are beautiful. Uh, and then the last example, we found this vampire squid, which was just hanging out, and it was un unaffected by us. We're using a light to illuminate this that's less bright than your cell phone light and we're getting these color images of it. So the animal isn't nearly as disturbed from that. So uh, again, my point is that t the technology that we use is key to seeing the ocean uh, through a different lens. Um, and so another take on that, uh, besides the low light imaging and all that sort of thing, um, I just wanna point out this robotic arm right here um, that's reaching out, I'll talk about this in a second. This arm is a very heavy duty arm. It's about the size of me, and the vehicle that it takes to run it is about the size of a Jeep. So it's really big, heavy-duty stuff. A lot of gear we're bringing down just to collect. If you're a biologist like me, uh, it's a lot of hardware to carry around just to do one particular thing. So another project I work on are these squishy fingers, which uh, use low-pressure seawater, just background seawater, to collect animals very delicately. And we've actually developed a whole arm. I can't show you that here today. Uh, but we have a whole uh, squishy arm that runs on two orders of magnitude less power than that big, heavy-duty arm that goes with it. And so the entire platform itself becomes reduced by it. And then when we dive down, back to the low light camera stuff, which is this here sitting on the front porch of Herc, um, we have the lights on, uh, guns are blazing, but it's really interesting to just turn them down and look at it from a different perspective um, to go with it. Now, I, those are good ideas, um, but I have a little bit of evidence to back that up, uh, that we're really missing a lot of uh, uh, things that are in the deep ocean because we're scaring them away. So last. Uh, take is if you're this deep sea shrimp right here and this giant 5,000 pound vehicle comes at you with stadium lighting on <laughs> You're gonna act a little bit differently and you're gonna run and then you reach out and try to grab it <laughs> You know, that's your that's your perspective from one of these vehicles um, And one thing I couldn't show because it's awful to your ears But these vehicles create a tremendous amount of noise as well in order to run those big manipulator arms and those thrusters They're running a hydraulic power pack and it's horrendous to hear the, the, the amount of noise that they create so this is my one slide of data. Um, so speaking of open data from, uh, from the NOAA Office of Exploration and Research, thank you very much. Um, these are some dives they did, I think, in 2016 in the Western Pacific. Um, and this Etch-a-Sketch line you see in the middle here, this is a dive profile of their deep ROVs. They work together, so there's two of them. The red line is the seafloor, 
We've got depth here. And what we're looking at is acoustic backscatter collected from the vessel at the same time. Stuff in blue is stuff. It's fish, it's jellyfish, it's shrimp that are in the midwater. On this particular dive, they were trying to explore the midwater and, and put them in the camera. So the vehicles go down deep and all the scatterers go up. Then they say, oh wait, they're up here, we're gonna fly up, and they all go down. And then they recover the vehicles and they go back to doing what they were doing in the first place. <laughs> so you're just not seeing that at all. And again, this is what all of these big exploration vehicles look like. They look like Herc, they look like Deep Discover, these wonderful pieces of technology. And I'm, I used to be an ROV pilot, and I, I love these things. But then I started looking at it from the biological standpoint, and I said, oh, maybe we should redesign these things a little bit. So my last slide, it looks like proposal land because that's where I'm at right now. Um, actually, on the left, oh, sorry, excuse me. On the left, I've invested a lot of money uh, with my new position to buy a winch, which is like the most boring thing I could do with my money. But it's a cool winch. It's a small winch, uh, and it will provide access and allow me to bring out other people's platforms, including my own. So something on the right, I'm proposing something I call the simple platform, a battery-powered platform with a low-light camera, some dim lights, and that same technology that showed you those backscatters, let's put that right down there and see if we can turn up the volume in terms of lights, in terms of noise, and see what these effects are and try to parse that out. Or, since this is a workshop, if other people have other ideas on ways that they would like to explore uh, more elegantly, I'll put it that way, underwater, come see me, because I got the winch. So I just need something to put onto it um, to go with that. Uh, yeah, with that, thank you. Okay, it's a lot of motivation, so uh, now we can get into some discussion. Uh, I'll start off with a couple of questions, then we'll just uh, range free with the, the crowd. Um, of course, sensing is, is being revolutionized in many ways. You know, we're opening up all kinds of different things we can sense now with new technology. One of which is in situ DNA sequencing because you can get an nanopore sequencer now for about $5,000. Uh, they're gonna get much cheaper. You know, soon you'll be able to plug it into your cell phone. Of course, you have to prepare samples. That may be where the, the difficulty is. But you know, this could be intriguing to get real time. Instead of waiting months, as you mentioned, to get the data back, have it sequenced in a lab, so on and so forth. Just have the data, the stuff continually processed. Uh, do you guys see this as being a potential future? Is, is, it, is it a relevant thing for you? To get some idea of the biology just from DNA that's around in the water? I, I could tackle it. I just know that there's a, a whole project out of Vimbari that, that did this. I think Pete worked on this. This is one of your, uh, one of your things. Uh, I forget the acronym. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it is possible, but it was, it was pretty big. And I think it's just along the same vein as, as Anna was saying. Um, there's sort of a lot of money out there to sort of put a, a first idea, but in terms of making this a bit more robust and smaller, um, I think that's where the hope is. So. Yeah, I mean, now you can get them about the size of your hand. Of course, you have to work at pressure, which is another, another factor. And again, prepare the sample. But, that's uh, new to me. That's really cool. Intriguing future. Yeah, if I might tag on to that, the, the ESP or the Environmental Sample Processor developed by Ambari was originally something about the size of a, of a very large garbage can. They then made it down to about the size of a, of a coffee can with the goal of putting it on AUVs. Uh, it was actually tested in the Great Lakes last year to detect a harmful algal bloom, uh, so very successfully. But I, what we're really seeing in the tech space in this arena is within the next 10 years, probably flow through sampling capability. Um, so you, could, you can envision a world in which you had a terrain following uh, AUV, so an autonomous underwater vehicle, not an ROV that's piloted by somebody, with say stereo cameras, uh, other environmental sensors, and flow through uh, DNA sequencing. And all of a sudden you, you have the potential of being able to characterize not just what exists in that habitat, but the environmental conditions that it exists in, and not just those things that you can see that are existing in that habitat, but all of the DNA that might be present in that water stream at any given time. I, I firmly believe that if we're able to do this, we're gonna, we're gonna lead to this uh, inductive research revolution where we basically to take a look at these gobs of data and start seeing um, correlations that we've never seen before, and that's gonna then lead on to a tremendous amount of follow-on research to, to try to improve our understanding of those environments. And uh, what about self-powered vehicles? I mean, you can make them autonomous, but they always come home, at least right now for the most part. You're starting to see these wave rectifiers with solar cells and other things. You can just let them go. They talk by a satellite. They can cache data, upload it, and you know, just go forever. Uh, is this going to be a, a game changer too, do you think? Or is there just too much power that we need to, to do what we want to do? 
Well, I think for, the sen for a lot of the sensors right now, I think that we need to work on the sensors to be able to adapt them to those platforms. But I think those are great platforms long term. You know, we have things like CT CTDs that we can get really tiny and put on those vehicles, right? But if we want to do some of these other kinds of analyses, our instruments are still not there. And so we need to, to kind of channel funds into that too to push those instruments to be smaller so they can go on those vehicles. I was wondering with your winch, if you can't just use a bladder, if you made the sensor smaller mm -hmm. instead of so heavy, that would be even more innocuous and... Uh, Definitely, yeah. I mean, I, I go in this direction of the winch because I wanted to simplify things underwater. I didn't want that, that bladder system to be my problem, which is a really great idea. And, and certainly, you know, uh, you know, adjustable buoyancy is a thing uh, to integrate into it. I just decided to put all the brains up top so I can look at it. <laughs> and the only thing I can focus on is changing the camera out underwater. Um, but, I, I, you know, if I understand your point, uh, there are some really interesting platforms that are out there for, for high endurance, but they haven't really gotten into the deep sea yet. There's some real limitations with doing that. Uh, you know, there's these really cool sailboats that can sail the ocean for months at a time. Gliders obviously can do that, um, wave gliders and all that sort of thing. But they're really working on the surface because they have to come up either to charge your cells or to get navigation data. If you're going to stay down deep and just stay there, you A, don't know where you are, and B, you're going to run out of power eventually. So there's some real limitations to break through if it's at all possible to break through on that you know, in the deep. Yeah, and I might add that at any given time, there are about 3,000 to 3,500 autonomous floating instruments on the ocean. They're called Argo floats. Uh, but, uh, uh, and they collect great data mm -hmm. about the, the ocean column, the thermal properties, the salt properties, and things like that. And, and increasingly, they're looking at adding biology. A limitation here is that they primarily are limited to the top 1,000 meters of the ocean. So that's good for a quarter of it on average, right? The other three quarters we really aren't getting with those, uh, those assets. And so I think it's going to end up being some combination of surface-based assets, whether they're ships or autonomous craft that, that are exploding in popularity right now, uh, or ROVs and, and AUVs as well, as, as in situ and fixed sensors as well. I mean, it's, it's going to be the combination of these technologies that's really going to be the breakthrough and getting them all to work together. Are these sensors that are out there now running off batteries like the old Sana boys, or are they... Uh... Yep. They okay, are. So they have to scuttle or, or yep. be recovered. Yeah, they're, they're, they're running off of batteries. Uh, generally, they get recovered when the battery dies and it runs aground someplace and, you know, there's an address on it. Ship it home. Um, but these batteries are, are, they last for several years. The data bursts are pretty small. Okay, so they're using Iridium satellite to burst the data periodically. The, the assets mostly dri uh, drop to a, a, a level in the ocean. They let the ocean currents take it so they don't power themselves in their direction. They're doing measurements along the way. They pop up periodically, they send the data up to, the, up to satellite, sends it to shore, then it pop back down and they're taking data again measurements uh, and also taking the vertical measurements along the way. So these things typically last for about a year and a half to two and a half years. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty phenomenal that's if you think lifetime. about it. And, and they do use the, the bladder system that you mentioned to, for the buoyancy control. Yeah, let's open it up for questions. Bob? Yeah, you want to throw me a football or uh, maybe i Sure, I'll... well you can take this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, you're always looking for low-hanging fruit and because the cost of being out at sea right off the top, that's such a huge step function. And I know that in our operation, I haven't seen people taking advantage of what I see as really low-hanging fruit because typically the ROVs go to the bottom. Yes, they do water column stuff, but his historically, a vast majority of the people that use our system want to go to the bottom, and then they want to stay there. So it's not unusual for our vehicles to stay on the bottom for two or three days. And I'm looking at that cable, and I'm looking at a cable that's right under my handling system, and I haven't seen people take advantage of that cable because you can ride up and down it for the price of buoyancy, and you can be extremely quiet. And you can stop and you can do all sorts of things in the water column. And I have not seen people take advantage of that because you can get down there. You can be, you know, as quiet as you want to be. You can put on as much as lights as you want to be and ride it all the way back home. And there they are to pick you up. And the price is free because the cable's there already. Thanks for mentioning that. That's a good Plug Bob. I talked to Adam Sewell a couple of years ago about that very that very notion. So for for those who don't know, our typical mode of operation is a two vehicle ROV system. You fairly you have a fairly taut tether that goes onto the top vehicle, and then more of a free tether to the bottom vehicle. You can absolutely climb up and down that tether. You could use some of the low light camera systems that you're talking about, buoyancy control, or or even some of the some of the the 
mechanisms that already exist can climb up and down cables. They, they kind of use a, a clip function to climb up and down the cable. Uh, you don't want to ruin your cable. These are not cheap cables. Um, so buoyancy is probably the way to go. But I, I absolutely think that that's a total missed opportunity. Uh, and it's also an opportunity that could be used anytime you're doing a traditional CTD cast on any other vessel that might be out there doing work as well. I'll just add to that same vein, the cable itself can be a sensor. That's something that I'm working on myself. So you can use it as a, you can measure temperature uh, using fiber optics through it, that sort of thing. So That's a great point. It's yeah. amazing what you can do in a continuous fiber. And we, we, we're doing projects in a marsh where we're getting fine grain temperature measurements through kilometers of fiber. Expensive on, on the top end though. Yeah. But your electronics are all up there. They're yeah, the fiber is really cheap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, sense, the electronics are the other story. Uh, anyway, more questions. Like to bring up a challenge. Uh, uh, oh, we sorry. mentioned the, the vehicles are heavy. Whoops. <laughs> Should I have a football? Uh, the vehicles are large and heavy. Uh, there was a whole uh, eras come and go in this field, and uh, decades ago there was a whole lot of effort in pressure tolerant electronics. Uh, lots of work. And it kind of came and went. There were some challenges, but a lot of things were developed. Semiconductors that could take pressure, uh, uh, just standard resistors, capacitors, and so forth. So I'd like to suggest, uh, if anyone wants to do it, a new generation of pressure tolerant devices so we can get these things much lighter, much smaller, and uh, get some more work done. Great comment. Any uh, any response from you guys? Oh, there's another question. Yeah, okay. throw that. You gotta yeah we got. I got to throw it. So <laughs> so while he's getting the the box I'll throw back it while to Pete, he answers. Um, I, I I have seen a resurgence of people looking at this arena. Of course, most of what we've been doing for a long time is wrapping things in titanium, right? And and finding creative ways to make sure that you can either have sensors inside that titanium or even slurp materials into the into the titanium. But I, I have seen a slight resurgence in this recently. I think one of the challenges is that there's an explosion in technologies. There's an explosion in communications capabilities. There's an explosion in sensors. There's an explosion in different types of vehicles and assets. And, and getting a community to kind of rally around a handful of those can be quite challenging and difficult. Um, nor necessarily is it the most innovative way to do things, but it, but having too diffusive an approach is as bad as having uh, a very focused approach. Yeah, and I'll, one thing I'll add on to that is that I think where you've seen that resurgence is through uh, biologging tags. So like, and they're getting good on at least a thousand meters, if not more, I think now, um, with cameras. So trying to do that and getting a few more sensors out of that. But that's its own little arena. Reapplying that, I think, you know, which what you're saying would be really cool. Back to other vehicles. There's always a compromise, too, because, again, the commercial sensors, as you mentioned, are so cheap. You can put them everywhere. If you can just do a little something to make them work, I mean, in a way that, that, that has opportunity, too. It works both ways. Okay. Thanks. So um, first, uh, a comment uh, for Brendan, then a question. So, you know, you, if I hear you correctly, you found sharks and volcanoes. Yeah. So you found Sharkano, which is your fundraising opportunity right there. I got that in a paper title. Movie. Yeah, all right, excellent. <laughs> um, but a, a, a question for the panel, though, uh, is, is this issue of advancing sensor development, right? As, as, as you've all mentioned, uh, you can, re with, within reason, get support to make that first generation of instruments, right? Now you want to take it to Gen 2. And what I have uh, encountered uh, in my own uh, professional life is that there is sometimes a tendency to say, well, why not commercialize it? So let's just, I wanted to pose this question of commercialization versus non-commercialization. With uh, my impression being that commercialization and my experience being that that's a pretty hard row, like a uh, road to go down uh, when you start thinking about the market, right, and how small it is. So how, how, what are your thoughts on how do we strike this balance in moving technology forward between commercialization uh, and non-commercial opportunities, between centralized programs and diffuse programs? Would you mind elaborating more on that? Sure. Um, it's a tough one. I mean, my druthers would be to have everything commercialized 
and out in the market space and for me to be able to pick and choose in an a la carte mode those different sensors and systems that I want to be able to use. Uh, but the government spends a lot of time investing in funding sensors. Uh, Pete, you and I were talking earlier about uh, a recent call that multiple agencies are going in on looking at sensor development, trying to fund some of the next latest and greatest. Uh, my agency sits within the Department of Commerce, uh, and we try to make good use of something called the Small Business Innovative Research Program, which is intended to get things from that kind of initial napkin idea stage to the concept stage to the testing stage, and then ideally on to the commercialization stage. Uh, but it's a really small number of things that are, can successfully navigate that whole window. And of course, there's a number of caveats that it has to be a small business and things like that. But, but I would encourage, uh, particularly the university set, to be thinking about commercialization and supporting commercialization for those projects and the, and the tools that are being supported, say, by agencies, but that the PIs are executing from a university perspective and trying to get them in that market space, uh, regardless of how small it is. I mean, it is, with manufacturing advances today, I think you can do it fairly inexpensively. Um, but the first step is kind of getting that concept tested and then you know running the trap lines of what's it going to take to commercialize and manufacture this in a way that you can actually make money. I think one of the challenges for the ocean is that, so if we develop a sensor and then we want to take it out to sea, we probably wait six months, a year before we actually get out to sea to test it. Then we find that something doesn't work. So then you wait for the next cruise, which might be another year. And so there's this, it's a huge amount of time from when you've develop your sensor to test it and then you want to make a next generation system and your grants are probably finished by then. And so how do you get the money to, you know, develop that next generation system that's probably not quite at the commercialization point? I think that's where, that's where my lag, I feel like, is in my research. I agree with that. <laughs> Alan. So I, I, I just wanted to speak to that um, point and ask a question. So um, if you go to Woods Hole, then in labs, all over the, the, the place, there are beautiful bits of technology tucked away in cupboards where a project finished and something magical was created just to solve that particular problem and then it disappears from the universe because it becomes one line in a method section that says we then developed this wonderful tool and it basically worked. Um, and one thing that would be awesome from funding agencies would be explicit support and requirement for taking those things and documenting the hell out of them. Right, just massive documentation and open documentation of those projects. Um, and I feel like th that's one thing that would really, it, so my question then becomes, um, taking the, the, the engineering and the science that we do under federal funding or private funding to some degree, um, how do you get people to write documentation? How do you get people to make open and public the, the engineering work that they did in service of the science? Well, so the, the wonderful answer to your question is that the, the federal government has made it a responsibility and a mandate for all of the findings from any federally funded research or, or engineering or development to be made public. Now, now, usually there's some period of time for intellectual property considerations, right? But this we're talking the matter of a couple of years, not a couple of decades. So that's something that, that came in under the Obama administration that the Trump administration is uh, looking to continue. Um, so that's a, that's a really good thing. But I, I would also add that part of this is is also incumbent upon program managers when they're writing their calls for people to su submit ideas for proposals to put that in as a written requirement. You, you as a program manager can do that. Uh, and the message that I'm receiving from you is that perhaps we should be doing more of that. And I, I, mean, I just, a slightly different question though. Um, I get credit for, we get credit for papers that we publish. We don't get credit for instructables, right? And, and in order for the, for the documentation that people do to be useful, it needs to be valued beyond just a line item. That's, that's the distinction, I think. Uh, that's a fair point that I, I don't know that I have an immediate answer to. How much of the underwater research now is classified? I remember back in the Cold War when I was a draper, uh, there was the classified JASA that some of my colleagues were publishing, right? It had a classified journal. Um, is it much more open now? I mean, is the, if DARPA funds you uh, or you get DOD funding, uh, can you as readily publish the details or does it tend to clamp down? Uh, well, I think it really is dependent upon the problem set and the funding agent. Um, DARPA actually does a lot of things that are tremendously unclassified. There, there's some interesting calls that are about to come out from them that are doing some amazing things in the ocean. They're looking at this kind of ocean of things call that's out right now. Uh, that's 
all the work that's going to be done there is unclassified. The application of that work might be in a classified domain or environment. All the work that NOAA funds is in an unclassified setting. Uh, the National Science Foundation is generally speaking in an unclassified setting. If you look at the, the Intel side of that, the DARPA for, for, for um, Intel called Incutel, their goal is to actually get people to, to spur the generation of product or software that is, can be publicly purchased. Right? And then the Intel community uses it. And their whole idea was that they couldn't keep up. They couldn't build Intel software systems fast enough to keep up with where the software world was going. So they, they basically just tried to spur the creation of new software tools and new companies that they then just bought the tools from. So I, I can't give you an estimate, because I quite frankly don't know how much of it is classified and how much of it is not. Uh, but I, I definitely think that there's been a, a, a very large democratization of ocean science. Um, not just from a funding agency perspective and the federal government, but also there's a lot of philanthropic groups out there right now. There, there are three or four different billionaires who have their own vessels with their own ROVs or HOVs or AUVs that are, that are supporting science, that are supporting technology development. Um, so this is, this is really exploding. And you're looking at um, folks like Europe and the U.S. who are looking at this thing called the blue economy about how the, the, the ocean space is really the next great economy. Right? Whether you're looking for shipborne commerce or recreation and tourism or fishing or, as I noted previously, novel therapeutics or, or cosmeceuticals, um, this is a, the next great place. Hopefully we're going to do this right, um, but this is a place where the economy is looking to explode in the next 25 years. Great. Uh, I, I, I just tag on to that. I run into the – I am frustrated, though, by this because on the researcher end of, of things – if I'm trying to explore a new topic that I want to address, I operate exclusively in an unclassified world. I don't have clearance. But then I keep running into, if I, somebody once in a while will talk to me, and they'll say, well, that's been done. Well, that's been done. Well, you should maybe read this, but you can't read this. And it, and it really frustrates the heck out of me. And I wish there was a way that I could apply for clearance just from a research standpoint, not that, because it's, like, it's like a need to know thing. So I can't get in there. I can't join the club unless I'm, somehow like have a good reason. And my reason is I purely want to just learn more. And this, this has been frustrating. I don't know if you've run into this before, but yeah, I've just been exploring some of these, like on fiber optics, for example, where I've just, I just hit a wall and I have to come at it. I spend a lot of effort trying to learn about things that I can't. Well, ideally <laughs> there's, there's more cooperation. I mean, you see it in the aerospace community too, right? Where spy satellites are suddenly given to scientists to explore planetary systems. So this is, potentially a good sign, who knows where the future goes. But as you're right, it's getting so democratized so fast that uh, you, know, you can very quickly build your own systems. Although you're right, they may have known about it 30 years ago. Right. How old is that satellite? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Julian. Uh, this question is primarily for Anna. You mentioned that laser absorption spectroscopy is one of your main sensing methods, um, but that it cannot be conducted underwater. I'm trying to understand what the technical limitation is there. I know that, for example, there's a lot of work in underwater laser communication, so, so presumably lasers can. So the wavelengths we work at, as soon as you put them through water, it gets absorbed. And so we can't the light can't travel very fa far in the water. So that's our limitation. And so we get around it by extracting the gas that's actually out of the water. And that works for all the different techniques we work on. Yeah, met methane absorbs in the IR, so it doesn't go through water. But on the other hand, what about NMR? There are other ways to find that methane. Have you thought about not using optical techniques? Yeah, we've been using some other techniques in our lab, especially you can buy very small, cheap sensors for a lot of gases these days. And so we've been working um, with those which aren't IR, um, looking at just can we take these cheap sensors and adapt them to the ocean? And even the chemical polymer ones? I mean, the electronic noses, right, they're all polymers. So the ocean tends to follow stuff, but are those viable at all? For well, we've been using membranes, uh, again, to get the gases out of, out of our samples. Um, and so we've been using some solid state gas sensors. Um, and trying those. So you still pull the gas out. In situ is, is tough. We still pull the gas out, okay. yeah. But there's some interesting technologies out there. Um, obviously, sonars are able to find the bubble plumes. They can't, of course, measure volume or anything like that necessarily yet. But there's also some interesting um, work out there using hydrophones that may be able to, um, if done right, measure the flux of the methane as it's leaving uh, the ocean bottom. Um, so this is something that's like really emerging. I, again, this is a tough problem. If you're going to use sound for this, you have to basically eliminate all the other sound in order to do it well or be able to filter it out. So, um, but there's some interesting things that are that are emerging in that arena. And we also, um, to go along with what, he, what Alan said, is that we use the sonar to actually find the bubbles. And then if we want to measure the chemistry of them, we'll then you know, move to using the chemical techniques. So a lot of these technologies work together. We don't, right now we don't find them using the chemical techniques. We use the sonar. 
and then we have to do the measurements with the. Is it, is it passive sonar, cavitation, or is it active? We have a sonar right on the vehicle. Are you listening, um, or is it are you sending something out and getting a return? These are typically getting returns. Okay. Yeah. Well, the military knows how to listen for that <laughs> very well. So if that's you classified. classify Brennan. <laughs> uh, other questions? Uh, we get. We need the. You know, who has it? Do I have it? Well, actually, you're on tape. Well, no, no, that's an old word, isn't it? You're on stream, so we have to give you the football. It's real to real. Um, I just am really curious about, you have mentioned the democratization of ocean science, and then you talked about having these barriers where it takes sometimes a year to get on a ship and another year to get on a ship the second time to then after you fixed it. What are the barriers to getting your equipment aboard those ships that billionaires are offering left and right for the use? So I have a cruise on one of those ships this fall um, on the Falcor. Um, and we're going to go out to Cascadia Margin to do some methane measurements. Um, one of the barriers is that we apply for ship time two, two and a half years before we actually get the ship time. Mm -hmm. And so we're planning cruises. I think we applied, I want to say actually 2016, 2015 and 2016 to get this cruise in 2018. So our lead time is pretty far out. Um, and so at the same time, we're applying for ship time. We're looking for funding to support our science on that. We're developing the, the system. And so the call just in the, was in the fall for, I think, 2020 cruises. Mm. And so you've got to be planning pretty far um, out in, uh, sometimes to get on these cruises. The same with applying for UNL ship time is when you put in a proposal. I just put in a proposal, and I asked for ship time for 2021. I mean, so we're, our, the lead time is pretty far out. And so that's one of the limitations just in the way the funding cycles work. There are many new resources that make more ships available, and they may not have all the technical equipment on board already, but there's several of those that are available. Uh, I know one in Australia, a guy named Chris Bone, that started one that is literally that. It's pairing pri uh, public ships with private entities that need to use them. So one of the limit, other limitations is that um, in a lot of these environments we want to work and we want to take our instruments, we need deep diving vehicles. And so, for example, I went on Nautilus um, last year. We wanted to go to a, a site that was 4,000 meters. And so we needed to use a deep diving submersible. So we can't, we're limited in what ships we can use that can have the deep diving subs. And so we need both the ship and um, those facilities at this point. And so that's sort of one of the limitations too. That's the barrier I'm trying to break. So I'm trying to make everything smaller which means more boats can be used and it's easy to mobilize and that sort of thing. So we'll see if it works out, but yeah, this, this is the reason I'm going in this direction of making things as simple and as small as possible so that it doesn't become this massive effort two years out. Somebody can call up and say, I want to go out next month. I got the boat ready. I'm ready too. Yeah, it goes back to the old adage, right? I mean, you, you, the, the smart person knows that you don't own a ship or a boat. Right, you, you know a friend with a ship or a boat. Um, okay. Because the minute you own a ship or a boat and you're provisioning that ship for use, you wanna make sure it's maximally utilized so you can make it efficient, which means that you are forced to have these time planning horizons that are a year or sometimes longer. Um, but in, in a bit of a shameless but cautious plug for ourselves, one of the things that we are looking to do in the coming years is to be able to use our ship time when we're out just doing bathy mapping operations, not say ROV operations, uh, when, the, when our aft deck has space, when we have empty berths on the ship, uh, of opening it up for folks in the, in the technology community to test out their assets uh, using the ship, right? And we've got the basic winch systems on it, the basic cranes, things like that. Uh, we want to do it in a minimally in to interfere mode because we are out there conducting missions. Um, but this is one of the things that we're looking at. We're going to do two, de two demonstration cases of that this year to see how that goes. Uh, again, that takes forward planning. That's not something that can, hey, I've got an idea. Next month I want to test it. Um, but th now you're talking the 6- to 12-month horizon versus you know, the 12-month to the 36-month horizon. How about running parasitically on, on commercial vessels? I mean, they're always crisscrossing the ocean. They're going to be autonomous soon, at least freighters. Uh, if you have a small payload that can make useful measurements, or even hijack the sonar on the vessel and, and use that information as well. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're, you're talking about that. So some of this already happens, right? So depending on what the measurements you're looking at, there's uh, any number of ships in the transportation industry, the commercial transportation industry, that have these things called XPT auto launchers on the back of them. So you basically put the box on and it shoots a little missile-like thing over the side, which then as it goes down, uh, does some temperature measurements. That is a wire, tethered to a wire, then that gets stored on the ship and transmitted via satellite. Uh, and also for years, NOAA has partnered with uh, the, 
the cruise ship industry to actually put sensors on the ship and put scientists on the ship. The scientists are then taking measurements while they're out on the cruise ship. The only requirement for the scientists, no cost to the scientist, was that they have to give kind of science education seminars to the, to the cruise ship passengers. Unfortunately, that one's kind of fallen by the wayside because uh, it looked a little bit too much like a junket. Um, even though good science was getting done at very low taxpayer cost. but uh, So there are things like that are happening, uh, some in more robust ways than others, typically not in the deep submergence world. Uh, that, that's a much more challenging game. And they're so site-specific. Yeah, yeah they're because they're, they're going on trajectories that never change. Target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't roam or go where you want to go necessarily. Yeah, true. Thank you. Do you know of any um, Air Force to crowdsource the development of sensors or technologies uh, through challenges, uh, crowdsourcing uh, enterprises, or let's say using you know, incentive and the likes? Yeah, so one that's going on that you've already mentioned to the XPRIZE, there's the Shell Ocean, uh, I think guess it's called Ocean Discovery XPRIZE. It's focused on mapping the ocean at a higher resolution when there's no ship in the, in the loop at all, just using autonomous assets, whether they're ship, uh, shore-based or surface-based or, or subsurface. Uh, NOAA tacked on a million-dollar prize to that competition for chemical sensing. Um, so we're looking, we're looking forward to seeing what's going to come out of that. It should be within about the next week where the first round winners are announced. Uh, and so we'll see what they're going to be looking at for the, for the second round. Um, so that's going on. Uh, there is conversations by the XPRIZE community to want to do more in the ocean space. This is going to be one of the big issues, I think, for the next decade or so. Uh, and then the Schmidt Ocean Institute has is, is got what's called the Schmidt Technology uh, Partners, which is a, a sister organization to the Schmidt Ocean <laughs> Institute. And they are literally looking to fund rapid development of technologies and sensors and systems for the ocean domain. I don't think that they've had a public call to date. Um, but they're starting to put together an advisory committee to, to figure out what that call might look like. <coughs> okay, the clock is rapidly winding down with T-minus 20 seconds, uh, so I've been encouraged to bring this to a close. It's been great. We could go on for another hour. Uh, it's a great conversation, and it's a great time for this kind of thing. So we're going to learn so much more with new sensors, new systems, and, and probe the ocean in many different ways. So let's thank our panelists. And... Uh, I think we have lightning talks and demos out there, so don't miss them. Thanks. Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session on democratizing the panel. I'm Andy Lipman. I'm here at the Media Laboratory, and I was volunteered to moderate this panel, probably because I know the least about it, so I'm a fish out of water. And I promise that's the only fish joke you're going to hear. There's not going to be any jokes about nets and stuff like that. Um, but I, I can't help but think to, to, to be keying off some of the things that were, that were said earlier about the lack of knowledge that people have about, about the water. I, how many people read Longitude? I'm sure everybody here read Longitude by Davis Sobel, right? But I'm not sure if you remember the introduction. But the introduction to that book, there's these British sailors that are sailing home on a merchant ship. And for some reason, one of the sailors down below, not an officer, thinks they're going to run into the Scilly Islands, okay, which is an obstacle on the way to Britain from where they were going. So he goes up and, and he tells the captain that we're going to land the ship on the rocks. And the captain, who's a British captain, does, of course, what any good British captain would do in that situation, and that is he hung the sailor. Um, a little bit later, they landed on the rocks, and everybody on board died, except the captain who landed on the island and was killed three weeks later for his ring by somebody else who was, who was on the island. Now, OK, now we're talking about people who don't really know the sea and don't really know the ocean. These are sailors who didn't know the ocean and didn't know the sea. Bob Ballard talked earlier about people not knowing the sea. My neighbor across the street who sold me my first boat Okay, his wife did not like water over her head, as it was said in the slide this morning. And I said to him this 30 odd years ago, I said, well, how does she take a shower? <laughs> she doesn't. She takes baths. So when he says there are people who don't like water above their head, that's absolutely true. I, last week, I heard a story of a kid from the Midwest whose parents, young kid, parents dragged him to the seashore and threw him in the ocean. And he came out spitting and said, who put all that salt in it? OK, um, that's, that's the extent to which um, I, I think that this, this thing is, is an issue. And so that's what this panel is about. It's democratizing the ocean. It's not about giving fish the vote. It's about getting people to understand and to get out 
and to think, because the ocean is our last wilderness. It's my kind of wilderness. I sail. And when I'm out there, I'm out all by myself. And it's the last place on earth where you can do that. But at the same time that I'm out there by myself, I'm a member of a larger community, a larger community of boaters. That's why any boater anywhere will come to the aid of any other boater who's in trouble. Doesn't matter how far away you are, you divert immediately. So you're alone, but also part of a community. And you're also enmeshed in a world of data. All of the ships that are out there are contributing to the weather map. When I take my boat, used to take my boat, there used to be a guy on the way to Bermuda who would give weather routing to all of the people who were out there on the Atlantic, traveling across the Atlantic or down to the Caribbean, named Herb Hilgenberg in Canada. He recently retired. He knew more about the weather than Noah because he had reports from all of the boats that he was routing as to what the deviations from what the models and the maps had told us. So we're a member of a community, we're contributors of data, we're all of those things. So I think what this panel is about is getting people out. I think that what's wrong with the world today could largely be solved by getting people out of their environment, out of Kansas, and into their broader world, into the world where the sea is not something that's surprisingly salty, where it's not something that you don't know how to swim in, where it's something that's intimidating and distant and far away and scary and unknowable, because that's what broadens our perspective, and that's what broadens our curiosity, and that's what makes us people. And if we fail at that, then we've lost long before we run out of food. And so that's what I hope we're going to explore in the course of this panel from several perspectives, from the perspective of data, from the perspectives of engagement, from the perspectives of stories, and from the perspectives of anything that you want to bring up with respect to the ocean. So pique your curiosity, broaden your perspective, and think during the seven minutes that each panelist will spend opening up the topic of questions, because there'll be plenty of questions and time for questions after that. I'm going to only say welcome, Asha, and each panelist will in turn um, introduce themselves and then tell you what they're about. So thank you, and we'll begin. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow, great. All right, well, I'm Asha DeVos. I'm a Sri Lankan marine biologist, and I've pioneered blue whale research in the northern Indian Ocean. So that's kind of my thing. Did I press something? Um, but uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences um, in terms of ocean research and conservation, and a little bit about how we can think about democratizing that space. So. Here we go. All right, so I'm a marine biologist and I am completely passionate about engaging and inspiring the next generation of diverse ocean heroes. And in my attempt to do so, um, I talk about a lot of different topics. One of my favorite is actually whale poop. That's whale poop up here. Um, and why whale poop? Because it's beautiful, it's memorable, it's engaging, it's an opportunity to educate people, it's fun, and transcends all boundaries, and it gets a reaction. And to me, those are some of the fundamental key ingredients that we all have to have when we're trying to communicate outside the bubble that we actually live in. Apart from this, I also do a number of other things. I mentor students, particularly from the developing world. I take students out on expeditions. I um, run an informal monthly gathering of the general public, and we discuss marine conservation issues, and everyone's expected to read a scientific paper before they attend this event, and they actually do, which is quite remarkable. Um, I'm starting an artist residency on my boat, my research platform because I want to bring the arts into the sciences. I um, also um, I engage with media in the local languages in Sri Lanka, and I work with social media because that's really where the world hangs out. Apart from that, I've also set up the first marine conservation research and education organization in Sri Lanka called Ocean Swell. 
And the reason I did this was, again, because I come from an island, and you'd think everybody had some connection to the ocean, but the vast majority of people don't even swim. And for me, this lack of ocean literacy is actually a big problem. And it's my work that actually started a marine conservation movement in the island. Um, but I want to see that continue. And as I say, when I die, I don't want it to end. So how do I make sure that what I do is actually sustainable into the long term? When I was setting up Ocean Swell last year, a lot of people asked me why I would choose to set up such an entity in such a remote part of the world. And I found this question interesting, but also quite symbolic. The problem is that we've come to expect marine conservation to be done in countries like, you know, in North America, in Europe, in Australia, and those are the places it happens, and it doesn't happen in the rest of the world, right? And this is obviously problematic. And because from the way I see it, you know, my big thing is what if the solution to our greatest ocean challenge is trapped in the mind of a student from the developing world? And this is not something that's too far from the tr uh, truth or not impossible because honestly about 70% of our coastlines are actually in the developing world. But of course, when I attend ocean-related events, as you can all um, um, probably imagine, I'm faced with the harsh reality that the vast majority of people around me are not from those 70% of the countries. Representation is next to nothing. And in fact, who the representation is from the 30% of the countries who then go on to make decisions on behalf of 100% of the countries. And this is not a sustainable model. Um, quite frankly, if we really want to save the oceans, we need a co uh, every coastline needs a hero, a local hero. Someone who speaks the language, someone who understands that stretch of the ocean, someone who can communicate with the um, communities, can engage, can come up with local solutions, and in the long term, someone who's actually going to be there and s remain there. And that's incredibly important. So local people are so important to the health of our coastlines, um, but oftentimes they're ignored and dismissed. And um, instead, parachute science, where Western scientists come into the developing world and do research and leave with no investment whatsoever, no training, is what happens more often than not, and that cripples these communities, but also it really derails our conservation efforts. So, why is it that we have such little representation from these parts of the world? Well, there's a whole host of things, but here's a couple of important points. First of all, like I said, we've come to believe that marine conservation is a path of the privileged. Because if you don't have the biggest vessel or the fanciest equipment to go out and do incredible research, then you're not pushing boundaries. And that means it's not really worthwhile. And we've come to judge the quality of science based on that innovation, that pushing of boundaries, that, that quality of data or how much data is coming out. But we haven't stopped to appreciate how much, um, how hard it can be to actually work in the other parts of the world. Perhaps someone might go out and get two you know, sightings of a whale over a year versus uh, in a small rowboat versus someone who's gone out in a massive big vessel and collect a hundred sightings. But how do we value what that science is? What's better? What's more important? What should be published? What shouldn't be published? And these are all questions that we should be asking. And then, of course, this work gets published. Um, publications are in horrible jargon. Most of us don't even enjoy reading those papers. I certainly don't. And then they're locked behind paywalls. Right? So this is, the, uh, this is the honest truth. They're locked behind paywalls, and so people don't have access. And then we complain that the vast majority of the world doesn't care for the oceans, doesn't engage with the oceans, won't in involve themselves with conservation, but then we aren't even allowing them to have access to the information that can allow them to make better decisions. Right? So there is distinctly a problem in how we're engaging these communities and how we're kind of telling our stories and getting things out there. Oh, I pressed the button I didn't want to press. <laughs> there you go. And I warned you guys, see? That was an example of what not to do. Um, so, so how can we change this? Well, we need to you know, lift this tank, or this lid of, over this tank blue, of blue water and let everyone slip in, right? So we need to take everyone to the HMS Hermes, which was the first purpose-built aircraft carrier that was sunk off the east coast of Sri Lanka. We should be taking people to this 
fascinating place in Hanifaru Bay in the Maldives to see, witness the largest gathering of manta rays in the world. Or how about taking them to the only place in the world where you can see the largest land mammal and the largest marine mammal in the space of two hours, Sri Lanka. Right? These places exist, but for so long, what have we been talking about? The seven wonders of the world. Because this world only has seven wonders, and they only exist on land. This is so inaccurate. We're underselling this incredible, magical kingdom that we have at our fingertips. So why are we not taking people to these places and letting them experience it? For sure, there's like a lot of tools out there, and these tools need to be affordable, accessible, and they do have to transcend all barriers. Whether they're language or age or whatever it is, we have to think about how we're getting, what tools we're using. And at the end of the day, what it might be is just a game. A game where people are learning without feeling like they're learning, and a connection to the ocean in every pocket. Perhaps that's what we're looking at. At the end, I mean, I guess the big questions are, how do we make the ocean a priority for people who can't spend their days worrying about it, who don't have the privilege that you and I do? How do we engage with people? How do we make it relevant to everyone? How do we allow people to dream and engage with the ocean, even if in the reality of their life, they have to work their father's paddy field for, till their dying day, right? That's what we need to be thinking about. And so for me, you know, I really am drawn to these faces. I see them and I think, how can I make that man who's walking down the street, perhaps on his way to work, he's got a lot on his mind, but how can I make him think about the ocean as his interlude, his respite, and his escape? Because at the end of the day, my dream is that everyone will talk about the ocean at least once a day. What I want is for people to gossip about the ocean. Because 70% of our planet is ocean, but really, how many of us know what lies beneath? Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, I, I think I have to wait for them to change the slides. But um, So, hi everyone, my name is Shaw Selby. I'm a conservation technologist, which I'll kind of explain what that is and why it's a, its its own term um, as, I, as I talk. Um, about some of the work that we do. So, is that the first one? Oh yeah, there's me. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so I started an organization called uh, Conservify, which is a nonprofit technology development lab um, place, and we we put it in in the place where everyone thinks about when they think about wildlife conservation, which is um, downtown Los Angeles. Um, and we and what we do there is we build technologies to help conservationists and scientists better monitor, understand, protect this planet. And, and the reason why we're focused solely on that is because um, of a few things. I'll talk a little bit about where we are in the technology landscape, but, um, but, the, but the, the other side of it is, is a lot of what, what Asha was talking about is in many parts of the world outside of these borders, it's very expensive to, uh, to be able to measure and protect these environments, right? The tools that are currently available are just kind of absurdly priced. They're, there's, they're offered by just a few companies, and, and typically they're in, the, in the past they were developed off of proprietary designs and, um, and sold for whatever they wanted to sell for. Um, but we now live in a time where um, where technology is changing rapidly, incredibly rapidly. You know, this there's many people in this room that had all of this these devices, right? And and people used to spend a fortune on this sort of stuff, right? And now we all carry a computer in our pocket that does literally everything on that slide. And and the time span at that that these things are changing is is incredible and it's astronomical and it allows us to do a lot of really amazing things. Um, and so that's what we focus on. Um, one of the things that we try and do with the work that I do is everything that we develop is open source. So, you know, if, if we design something, we put the designs and the code and everything um, on the internet for anybody to use. But more importantly, when we're working with communities in different parts of this world, we, we teach the folks that we're working with um, how to build it, how to maintain it, how to, you know, make their own modifications of it. And we basically hand it off. And, and you know, the goal of my organization is, is basically to always write us out of the projects that we're working on, right? Is because I would rather work on something that builds the capacity globally for us to solve some of these problems as opposed to being the sole provider of drones or XYZ for, you know, conservation purposes. So, um, so some of the stuff that we work on is drones. And, and I like to talk about drones because it both 
demonstrates the potential of how fast this technology you know, development can, can fundamentally change the work that we do, but it also demonstrates the pitfalls. So um, I got a grant from National Geographic in 2013 to work on drones. And when I started the grant, we, we, were, we were doing drones for coastal conservation purposes. That was the, the purpose of the grant. And when we started it, it made more sense for us to build drones because there wasn't a lot out there. It was expensive and it didn't really have the capabilities we wanted to. But by the end of the grant, the industry had changed so much that it just made more sense to buy the stuff that we needed. Um, and, and that's like really how fast that changed. And you, I mean, everybody here has heard about how popular this technology is. You know, some of you guys maybe got it for Christmas or your birthday or something. Um, and, and that's fantastic because now we have this great technology tool all across the world. But the problem is now people think that drones are gonna solve all their problems, right? So when we work with the community, more times than, than I'd like to admit, I've walked into it and they said, oh, we need a drone for this, you know? And it turns out that like, most of the time they don't. So as an organization, we walk back with them and we say, okay, what's your real problem? What are you really trying to solve? And let's see if we can move forward and, and figure out what it is. And it, it typically isn't drones, but sometimes it's drones. Um, we do a lot of work with creating low cost electronics. So um, some of the stuff that we're doing th this year specifically is, is GPS tracking of sharks and, and, and whales, both in Belize and uh, Antarctica. And so we create low cost open source units that, that we're able to kind of sell for that, um, or work with the scientists to, to deploy that sort of stuff. Um, we, we worked with NOAA um, this last year to create a, a low cost CTD device. So those of you who, who don't know what that is, that's conductivity temperature depth sensor. Um, and so we're, we'll be deploying that a lot with some scientists that couldn't afford the really expensive versions of, um, of the CTDs that, that, are, that are usually um, made. Um, another great example of, of using low-cost methods and, and technology development to do a lot of great stuff comes out of a colleague of mine whose name is uh, Topher White, who created this, this project called Rainforest Connection. So it's not ocean-related, but basically they take old donated cell phones, they put microphones on it, and they put in the rainforest to listen for illegal logging. So we got a grant actually through National Geographic as well to collaborate on bringing that same sort of technology into, into the oceans and how it would work in the oceans. And we've, we've took a derivative of that, that rainforest connection hardware and put it on some buoys and deployed them in different places to listen um, underwater and try and specifically what we're looking for is trying to detect um, fishing activity in places where it's not supposed to be happening. So but just based solely off the, the acoustic signature and uh, machine learning and some of the other techniques that we're using for that technology. But you could tell a lot from the underwater acoustics as people here mostly know. Um, and, and lastly, a, a thing that we work a lot on is, is sensors. So I'm really trying to bring down the cost of sensor technologies that's used in, in conservation, um, science, and citizen science efforts. And so we have uh, this, this, uh, this platform that we call FieldKit where we've been developing a lot of this stuff. Um, a lot of the how this usually happens in, in, uh, in practice is, you know, some organization or a scientist comes to us and they say, hey, we want to develop a sensor that does, or we, we want a sensor that does this, but the only version that we can buy costs 5,000, 10,000, 30,000, whatever it ends up being. And so we'll go back and try and design an open source version of that. And so we've done that a number of times um, and we're building a, a library that, that we're publishing this year um, online of, of the sensor designs we've done to date and some of the ones that we're gonna do moving forward that can test for things like water quality, flow, and um, all sorts of stuff, depending on, on the organizations that we've worked on. And the FieldKit platform kind of allows a way to visualize that data and collect that data as well. Um, uh, and, and I'm not gonna talk too much of this because we have, uh, we have crowdsourcing and citizen science experts coming up after me. But that this is another area where there's a lot of potential in using technology to democratize the, the work that we do in the oceans. It's really engaging the public and giving them the tool through, through things like apps and, and low cost devices that they can go out and gather a lot of this information um, themselves. Um, so conservation technology, I said, I'm gonna explain a little bit what that is. This, this has emerged as something that you know, a handful of us do throughout the world that's focused solely on bringing these like recent innovations in technology and kind of lower cost methods into conservation. You know, technology has always been a part of science and conservation in some aspect or another, but we've never really been in this point where 
um, the ability for us to do things at, at actual really low costs and the capabilities that th those stuff have, it's never been better than it is today and it's only getting e even, even more, um, more amazing as time goes on. So all these big buzzwords that you guys hear about, um, about what's happening in the technology space, things like blockchain and um, computer vision, DNA barcoding, there's folks um, that, I, you know, that I know that are working on these sorts of things and adapting them into the, the conservation space, the ocean, ocean conservation space. So there's a lot of potential there. Um, and then the other thing that's really amazing about where we're at is <clears throat> there's opportunities to take that that idea that you might have or um, or the, the problem that you want to work on and find ways to get them funded. And this is something that was hard earlier, but now there's so many people who are excited about the idea of using technology to solve some of these problems that a lot of like the foundations and other organizations will fund them or do interesting stuff. So in, in 2015, I, I had an idea that I came to National Geographic for about creating a prize for um, for the protection of marine protected areas using lower cost technology and engaging the community and this kind of stuff. And so it took us some time to develop it, but, but National Geographic launched this marine protection prize um, earlier this year, or last year. Anyways, they, they, it just closed, the, the, the registrants just closed. And it's the, the feedback we had from it and the amount of participants is amazing. It's five times bigger what, than what I expected to actually apply for this sort of prize, which shows there's like a desire and there's a passion around creating solutions to some of these problems. Okay, I'm almost done, just nearly done. And then the other, the other amazing thing is that there's, there's now platforms and, and, and places where you can go to gain this sort of help and, and gain expertise. So if you have an idea for developing technology but you don't necessarily have the coding expertise or something like that, there's places like uh, Conservation X Labs has this digital uh, makerspace where you can go and, and kind of explore some of these ideas. And there's communities like wildlabs.net that allows you to kind of meet with people who are interested in this sort of thing. Um, and, and very quickly, last, I'll say, I'm, I'm one of the judges on the Ocean um, X Prize, uh, or on the Ocean Mapping X Prize. And so this is really neat because they're, they're trying to map the entire oceans and do it in a way that's cheaper and, and different than the ways that they've done it before. And so there's, you know, there's nine, 19 teams now that are doing this work and, um, and there's a lot of really interesting innovation there. So um, I think it's a very exciting time for technology in this space. Wow. Wow. You guys are amazing. Uh, my name is Greg Trinish. I'm the founder and executive director of Adventure Scientists. And uh, very happy to be here. All right. So I started my career as an explorer. I traveled all around the world in different environments, trying to learn what I could from pushing myself to the limits of exploration. And while I was out there, I did that, and I also saw a lot of challenges along the way. I saw firsthand the people uh, and the environments that are struggling with so many of the things that we've talked about over the last few days here. Things like coral bleaching, illegal logging causing deforestation, wildlife trafficking, harmful algal blooms, shark finning, the list goes on and on and on and on. I knew that there was tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people like me who go outside every single day, they love the places that they explore, and if given the opportunity, they would choose to make a difference with the time outside. From my experience in the sciences, I knew that there was also a tremendous need for a boots on the ground army, and so we started Adventure Scientists with this mission to send people who are traveling in the outdoors, who love the outdoors, are willing to go through some training to go out and collect data where it can be used to address environmental issues. So today we have sent thousands of people all around the globe on expeditions to seven continents, five oceans. Uh, people have done things as diverse as uh, collecting the highest known plant life on Earth from Mount Everest at 22,000 feet. We've gone down 527 feet below the ocean surface. Uh, we've collected more than uh, samples from more than 3,000 places for our microplastic study. Uh, and that's just the beginning of what's possible. So I'll ask you guys as we're going through the rest of these slides to think about how you could benefit from a global network of volunteers, how an army of people on the ground in the water could benefit your work and what you would do with that unlimited resource. 
For Harvard Medical School, we collected scat samples all around the world in order to isolate the genes responsible for, for antibiotic resistance in the Enterococcus genus bacteria. So the theory is because they're one of the oldest on the planet and also one of the most prolific, it's likely that if you could address or you could find the common ancestor of this genus, you could probably turn off antibiotic resistance in many other species around the globe. Uh, this week, we're launching a project with the World Resources Institute that will have volunteers traveling from San Diego to Vancouver sampling big leaf maple as the first of many species that we will uh, begin to collect samples for. So we're collecting leaves and cores in order to create genetic reference libraries to make it possible as technology advances with DNA barcoding and handheld DNA sequencers to be able to walk into a furniture store someday in the future, zap a table and instantly know what species you're looking at, where it came from and whether it was legally or illegally harvested. That will make it far more difficult to transport illegal timber all around the globe and will eventually end that issue. So we have this global network and we actually don't know how big our network is. We have never maxed it out. And so we've never had more people, or excuse me, we've never had less people than we've needed for any given mission. We're not about getting as many people involved as possible or getting as many folks out there because we really focus on the quality of the data. We work with our partners to develop a scientific mission. We figure out how many samples are needed, how many volunteers are needed in order to get those samples, and that's who we deploy to get out there. We get our networks by recruiting top tier athletes from each sport. So this is Lakey Peterson, number four female surfer in the world, Mike Lebecki, Nat Geo cover boy, uh, Jeremy Jones, greatest snowboarder that's probably ever lived. Uh, and we ask these people to go out, become ambassadors for our projects, and then they share it through popular media, through their social media accounts, and that helps us to recruit this unlimited army all around the world. National Geographic has been a huge help for us in that. Uh, spreading the word about what we do and helping us recruit volunteers. Every single volunteer goes through a training process. So they may do that online. We use learning LMS or learning management systems, same things that big corporations use to train their employees. Uh, we also supplement those quite often with in-field training. So these can last anywhere from one day to seven days. Really just depends on the complexity of the protocols that volunteers need to follow when they're out in the field. Every volunteer passes the test. You have to get 100% on the test to be certified to collect data for us. Uh, and then you have to recert that test every six months. So we make sure that our volunteers are staying up to date on the protocols. When they're in the field, they're often wearing GoPros as body cams so we can actually see whether they were following the protocols when they collected the sample. Uh, we have apps that ask them if they're following those same protocols in the field. Uh, so we are able to ask things like, did you cap your water bottle? underwater, uh, just reminders that guide people through the process as they're moving through the process. Uh, perhaps the most important thing about what we've learned from running more than 150 of these projects now is choosing the right types of projects. So anything where you can deploy a sensor, uh, like this one Shaw built, uh, although that's pretty old and he's probably mad at me for showing that because it's old. Uh, <laughs> or uh, camera trap, whatever it is, anywhere where there's a technology that our job is really to train the volunteer how to use the technology, how to, troubleshoot, how to troubleshoot the technology. Uh, those work really well. And then anything where there's a sample collection, whether it's air, water, uh, whatever it is, we're happy to go out, train people how to not contaminate those samples. And then they often end up in a lab where the real analysis is happening. So the real beauty of this is what it allows us to do from a scale standpoint. We're able to go all over the world and bring back samples. We're able to send people who are already out there paying their own way to go on these expeditions. We can recruit people to go to specific locations as well. And just to zoom into the coast of West Africa here to give you a, a better sense of the resolution that we've been able to do for our microplastic study, uh, which instead of talking about, I will share a little bit more about since this is an oceans conference after all. And there is sound on that. Five years ago, we scooped up a half liter of water locally, brought it back to the institute. Looking under the microscope and seeing all these technicolored pieces of plastic led me to think of all of these larger questions. How is it affecting the ocean? Our drinking water? 
are microplastics everywhere, but I couldn't answer those on my own. So this is when I partnered with adventure scientists. Adventure Scientists is a nonprofit organization that unites explorers and scientists to solve some of the world's most pressing environmental issues in which access to data is crucial to resolving them. I worked with adventure scientists to train adventurers who would be collecting data for me around the world. I'm about to take a microplastic sample. I was able to get water samples from the Antarctic and the middle of the Pacific. We're gonna send this into the labs. Through the process of working with adventure scientists, I was getting closer to understanding the magnitude of this issue. After analyzing thousands of samples from around the world, we concluded that 74% of them contain microplastic pollution. Microplastics are one of the largest pollution problems that you've never seen. Without adventure scientists, I would have never been able to even dream about this breadth of data that I've been able to collect. The adventure scientist model lends itself to so many different projects, whether it be microplastics or forestry conservation or animal protection. This is just the beginning. So I just want to leave you with two more thoughts. One is, as we come up with these new technologies, things like hummingbirds flying around the forest to monitor wildlife in all kinds of miniaturized and cheaper and more effective ways to monitor, let's not lose sight of the fundamental importance of getting people out into nature and connecting people to these places if we want them to care about them. And the second is just another reminder, come tell us how you can benefit from an unlimited army of boots on the ground or fins in the water. Thanks. Hello? Hello. Is this, on? oh good. Okay, so my name is Annie Brett and I am a sailor and a scientist and I'm also a lawyer, so feel free to throw tomatoes at me or <laughs> otherwise express your anger at all the lawyers in your life. So I'm gonna try and go pretty quick here so we actually have some time for discussion, so if I race through anything, feel free to you know, ask me questions later. But so I spend a lot of my time at the intersection of science and law and thinking about this broader trend that we're seeing in science and scientific exploration in particular towards democratization. And, you know, Shaw and Greg discussed this. Technology has made um, this realm of science really accessible to people in a way that's unprecedented in the past. And in the face of this kind of general public involvement in scientific data collection, there's huge potential for understanding our environment in ways that we have never been able to before. But so what I'm really interested in is how we turn this scientific data into actual legal usable policy solutions. And it turns out there are significant barriers to using scientific data that's collected by non-experts in policy contexts. And lawyers are really bad at science. We don't really understand it. So we use some interesting proxies to try and determine when scientific data is reliable. And one of the biggest proxies, one of our favorite proxies, is looking at the educational background of the person who collected the scientific data. So in cases where we're talking about citizen science projects, this can be a huge barrier to actually using scientific data in legal, regulatory, and courtroom context, regardless of how accurate the data actually is. The fact that it was collected by someone who doesn't have formal scientific training often is enough to make fatal flaws in that data's ultimate use. 
there are obviously ways to do this, and there is this kind of circle in the middle, and I think Greg's projects are a great example of how you can structure projects effectively to gather citizen science data in ways that can be used in legal contexts. And you know, there's a whole slew of different ways to do this. I think having very good volunteer training is one of them. Having routine validation with professional scientists who come and compare their data to volunteer data. Making sure that projects are well-funded and staffed over time so there's a scientific record. I'm happy to go into all of these different um, measures in a lot more detail if you guys are interested in how projects can be effectively structured to inform management solutions. But at the risk of putting myself out of a job here, what I really want to argue for today is that we think about democratic data in a different way. And I think my big question is what happens when we separate democratically collected data from these silos that we're trying to put it into? And so if we think of democratic data not through a scientific lens or a legal lens, I think what we find is that data from the global population of particularly ocean users is one of our best means of gathering information about the state of the ocean. It helps us to be the first line identification of environmental problems and to really target solutions going forward. Ayana earlier today on a panel mentioned that it's critical that we uh, triage our resources. And we have limited resources and limited ability to make policy solutions. So we really have to focus on the issues that are the most pressing. And what I would argue is that democratic data is one of the best ways that we can really figure out how to triage and how to identify the most pressing problems. And we have a huge network of ocean experts out there from ship's captains who have been sailing for 50 years to coastal communities who rely on ecosystems in the ocean for their sustenance and livelihood. And these users may not have the scientific data and the legal data that we need to make end goal policy decisions, but they do have the information that will help us bring in scientific teams and policy teams to places that need that help the most. So I think what I wanna leave you guys with, and then we can discuss this more, is this idea that if we move beyond an idea of scientific truth as the only goal in our democratic data collection and our democratizing of the ocean and engage all the users of the ocean. This is a map of shipping routes, global shipping routes. So these are constantly traveled and these people have a significant amount of information about the ocean. We don't have to give them any scientific instruments. We don't have to give them new methods. We don't have to fund them at all. They're already out there and they already have a significant amount of information. It's not scientific data. It's not ultimate truth but it's information that can help guide our management solutions and our policy solutions towards more effective ends. And so what I wanna think about is how we can really engage these people and use their information to identify environmental problems and triage our management solutions. Thank you. Uh, I've, is this one on? I've, uh, I can't help but think that uh, you know, if you drive a, a, a car today, that car knows and can report almost everything about the environment around you. It knows if it's raining, it knows if it's light, it knows what the barometric pressure is, it knows what the temperature is, and all that. And I can't help but think why we don't have hundreds of coastal heroes, all armed with exactly that kind of thing that we can build into some package that we could give both to the scientists and the layman and, and make some kind of usable network out of everyone. and by building that network, maybe get people a, bit, a little bit more engaged. What, is that a reasonable kind of thing we should be thinking about? Yeah, I think it absolutely is, and I think there's opportunities to do that. And at the same time, I think it's really important that we pay attention to the fact that we can't be all things to all people at all times. And so to, is to put your car out we there. We can try. We can try, that's right. To put your car out there and have it be a sensor and reporting back to Google or whoever's going to own your car someday. That I was thinking of my swim trunks. <laughs> I don't know if I want those data. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're collecting whale. I, I, I have a freezer full. Absolutely. 
But I mean, for me, I think it's really neat that we have all these tools. But imagine if, you know, the problem is that vast majority of people don't even know about the ocean, right? We have this weird thing where people are more connected with outer space and what's happening out there than they are with what's typically at our doorstep. And for me, I find that really interesting because then we have all these tools, but we we can't get them into people's hands. We can't because they don't even know what the importance of their role is or they don't understand, that they don't have a foundation in what's actually going out, on out there. And I think that's you know, such an important thing to have that foundation before we can empower them to then become part of this network that can ho help solve these issues. I agree with you. And, 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 uh, but you know, space is easy. You just look up and you got it, right? The ocean, like, you, you can't see past the horizon. But one of the things that does tie us together between land and sea is the weather because that's, in, that's intimately connected to both. And that's why I keep coming back to the notion of, of the weather as being part of the connective tissue that would do it. But let's, remember I told, warned you that you were supposed to pique your curiosity and prepare questions, so who's first? And by the way, <clears throat> yes. oh, yeah. don't be intimidated by this, but if you're going to ask a question, you have to catch. <laughs> and I have to throw. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris it was, wasn't looking. I, I was unclear if it wasn't for me. Anyway, um, so I was just curious. I think a, a number of you talked about the need to get people like f uh, physically engaged with the environment to start really caring about these projects. Do you think it's necessary to be physically in these locations, especially if they're like inaccessible or hard to get to, or do you think technology can have a role in making people more engaged? In yeah, I mean, I, I think technology can definitely have a role, and, and people often talk about VR and AR and things like that to in bringing people into experiencing certain things. And I think, you know, people use smartphones every single day constantly, so there, there's some, there is a role of technology in engaging people. But I think there's also something about being out in the field and being you know, in these areas, and I understand we can't take everybody to some of these most pristine places, but, but, but we can still do a better job at engaging folks near those places. I mean, it, it, if you, th I, I was doing some work uh, 20 minutes outside of, of Yosemite with some students out there, and the, and the students grew up in the area and had never been to Yosemite. They were 20 minutes away, you know? So I think if we can get people out um, and engage them that way, that can have a big impact as well uh, beyond technology. Um, I just want to add, I, I agree. I think um, getting out there, obviously, like all of us, we we love being in the field. There's a reason for it. It's the sort of ev all these other things as well. It's the rejuvenation. Reju it's a whole lot of things. But I also have, I think we have to always remember that not everyone has the privilege of getting outside, right? Like we talk from a very... We talk from a place of privilege, for sure. And there's a lot of people whose priorities are not about just having a great time outdoors, which is why in places like Sri Lanka, when I said I want to be a marine biologist, people were like, what are you going to do? Because the ocean was a place of extraction. It's a vocational space. That's where you go. People get, that's their livelihood. But what I want to do seemed frivolous. It was, you're going to sit on boats and look at whales. How is that a job? How is that useful? And so I think we have to also think about, right, if, we can't get everyone out there. How do we make sure everyone has that connection? That's why I say, you know, a connection to the ocean in every pocket. That is that role of technology that that will allow us to take these spaces to people as opposed to always expecting be people to be able to come to those spaces. Go ahead, toss it. <laughs> Ash, I wanted to kind of further that discussion a little bit. In your every person that you want to connect to the ocean, I wonder if currently they are connected to any other environmental issues, you think, and that they're just missing the ocean, or is there a whole class of people that can't care about any part of the environment, whether they can see it or not, because they're more concerned about you know, getting food or paying their bills or things like that? I think there's a large part of the population of the world that doesn't have time to indulge in, like I said, what we, con we consider serious issues, but they just seem frivolous to people because survival is such an important thing, right? And that, that is something that we also have to understand when we're trying to drive our messages. How do we allow it to be, and that's why I said, how can we allow it to be that escape almost, right? Where we're talking about the ocean. So 
our messaging shouldn't always be doom and gloom. That's the other thing. Because if we're trying to get people to escape from that daily rigor of their life, but we want them to connect with this space and then talk about it, it can't be a space where they go to and they're just like, God, this sounds like hell, right? <laughs> Fair enough. You don't want them to feel like they're writing obituaries or reading an obituary constantly. So how do we engage people with that in mind? And I think that's really quite important as well. I mean, I, I think I, the I, answer is drones, by the way. Yeah. No, I, 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 think, I, I think that there is a specific issue. It is, it is more difficult in getting people to, to care about the oceans that didn't grow up right next to the oceans. It, it, it's a bit more of a leap than, than um, you know, uh, terrestrial type stuff. I, I work in both spaces, and I, it's a lot easier for people, unfortunately, just average people to care about elephants than, than whales, at least just in my, you know, meeting people across the world. Um, which it shouldn't be, and so that's something we have to figure out, is how to get people to be more engaged in that. I'm highly sympathetic to caring about the ocean. I spend all the time that I can on the ocean and in the ocean, and I always have. But I also care about the people. And I wasn't kidding about the drones, because, yes, I know that we can't bring everyone from Kansas or the interior of Sri Lanka, even though that's an island, into the sea, but we can bring in ways today that are cost effective the experience of the sea into them. And sooner or later, you're going to trip on it. Sooner or later, you're going to land in water. <laughs> and sooner or later, it's going to have an impact on you. And I can't help but think that there is something we can do about that. Who's next? How far can I toss this? <laughs> Thank you. Um, as someone from the aquarium space, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, aquariums have existed for decades to accomplish this connection, to inspire people about the oceans, to, uh, to educate them, and increasingly to tell the public what they can do to make a difference uh, and to help protect the oceans. Uh, and yet, obviously, the job isn't done. Uh, are there any things that you all would like to see aquariums doing that we aren't doing now that you think would better accomplish this objective you're talking about at a time when we really need the public to care and to change behavior and policy and, and whatnot to make Free a difference? Admission. Well, <laughs> uh, if philanthropy will go up, then, then, then we can look at that. Even the Metropolitan has taken to charging. Yeah. We do actually offer free admission to certain groups and to children, to youth, you know, whenever we can, but that's a good point. Who wants to try that? Okay, I'll jump in and just say that as someone who spent a lot of time sailing on the ocean and in really uh, blue water places, I think it can be frustrating to see the aquarium and actually kind of universal focus on the very charismatic, colorful fish and things like that. And I think that perspective can in turn lead to people not prioritizing some of the most important places in the ocean, the deep sea, the, uh, the high seas. And if that mindset of interest and engagement with the ocean as a whole can be established in aquariums, I think that would be a really cool and valuable thing to make people realize that it's not just you know the teeny coral reef that matters, but it's the entirety of the ocean, and there actually is stuff there. You know, It's not just an empty wasteland. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you so much for uh, sharing your work with us. And my question is, in addition to democratizing um, information about the ocean, um, how can we democratize information about, and maybe this is already kind of wrapped in, but how the ocean impacts people's lives, even if they're not coastal, but just the importance of the, the ocean as an ecosystem and how, because I think it's important to, to show people in their day-to-day -day lives like, you know, whether it's the fish that they're eating or whether it's the air that they're breathing, the importance of the ocean in that. And then the other question um, is around democratizing the um, ability to impact um, what's happening to the ocean. So this gets to kind of advocacy and emp empowerment, maybe some of the legal issues as well, but how are we able to, once people are educated, they can connect it to their own communities, how can they then act in a way that helps to protect the, the ocean as well as their livelihood? I, I just wanted to say, I, I, think, I think that's important for us to figure this out. Um, you know, ocean conservation 
runs into the same challenges just regular conservation does and the fact that um, we need to explain the urgency of the things that are happening without being too, um, you know, doom and gloom all the time because it's very easy to kind of fall into that. Um, so, so showing beautiful images, explaining the importance of the ocean in, you know, the global climate without making it too the whole climate's going to collapse and everything's, and, you know, explaining people the need to um, think about what they're eating without explaining that, like, you know, scaring them away from seafood. Well, I mean, it's, it's okay if we scare them away from seafood, but, but like, you know, make them feel horrible about eating um, sushi from 7-Eleven and things like that. Like, it, it's a hard balance to try and figure out. And it's really, because the oceans feel so remote to so many people, it's much more important that we, th we think through that and we do that um, in the right way. They're going to feel awful anyway after eating sushi from 7-Eleven. Um, there's also great groups out there. Like, so I live in Montana. I am pretty far from an ocean. Um, and there's great groups. Like the Inland Ocean Coalition is a group, uh, formerly the Colorado Ocean Coalition, that does exactly this. They talk about the connection between mountain environments and the ocean environments. Uh, there is, you know, what we did with the microplastics project is another great example of people who had no idea that this stuff was ending up in the oceans, but because they were part of the data set, whether in freshwater or in the oceans, they went on to invest their lives and their labor and their personal ability to make a difference in these issues. So 83% of our volunteers on the microplastics project have gone on to do beach cleanups, they've gone on to have started their own nonprofits focused on microplastics. These people are engaging in projects like, like ours and many, many others around the world and then going on to make a difference. And, and I think that those connections are becoming more and more clear every day. Uh, it, it, to me, is you got to go beyond just getting people to go look at the aquarium to go back to your question. You gotta go beyond just getting people to look at the pictures and interact with the technology. You have to have people really invest in these. And, and most people aren't gonna invest with money. Very few people are gonna invest with much more than an occasional uh, volunteer tour here or there. But if we can give people easy ways to invest what they have, whether it's their smartphones, or their personal labor, or their weekends, or whatever it is they have to give, uh, that's how we're gonna get people to really be united in mobilizing against the challenges we face. And I just wanna add, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, because I think humans are inherently um, selfish, we're driven by our ego, and if it's affecting us, that's the only time we're actually gonna start to care, right? So in our messaging, it is important to bring it back to us, humans. Um, that's incredibly important. And the connectivity, you know, we always say that all roads lead to Rome, but in fact, all waterways re lead to the ocean, right? So it doesn't matter if you live in a mountain, but what, what, what are the stories that we can tell or how can we show that connectivity to people that their actions up there have an impact down there? And then, you know, talking about whale poop, because it is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, the reason I talk about it is for all those reasons, but also, you know, um, I have a TED Talk called Why You Should Care About Whale Poop. And the whole point is, basically, it's the ocean fertilizer. 50 to 70 percent of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean, so we should really be thanking whales and their whale poop because they fertilize the oceans that allow for photosynthesis, that allow for oxygen, right? You start telling stories like that, people just like, oh, like poop, like gross. And then you get to the end of the story and they're like, oh, that's really interesting. So we need to be clever about our messaging too. And we need to be connect, we need to help them to connect to whatever is going on out there and to care. And that's, I mean, that's what we as scientists, certainly I'm a scientist, have just not been doing. We're so busy trying to turn over papers that get published and just filed away, that we're not translating that into something that's actually usable on the ground. And if the use is just the fact that someone will learn a story that they'll tell another person, that'll tell another person, that in itself is a huge action that can have knock-on effects down the line. Actually, we're doing quite a lot, some of it with Katie, on changing the scientific publishing process to be one that engages people in the act of, of not critiquing, but collaborating. And uh, that potentially builds a virtuous circle where you're educating the people as well as influencing the science that goes on. So you can make papers that hopefully are not necessarily dry and locked up and never read. 
Uh, oh boy, I don't so think I actually, can do it. We just published that microplastics data set. Uh, it actually yeah. was published this morning. Um, but we've also open sourced the data set or made it available publicly at least. So we've had 76 requests for that data set and we just share it with anybody who really wants it for an educational conservation or scientific purpose. Uh, so we, it's not quite open source in that we do screen who's using it. Um, but anybody who can benefit the world from it in any of those different ways, we gladly share it. And we've had amazing people come and ask for it, including governments of, of countries. Uh, Slovenian government reached out for that data set, um, which was God quite bless surprising. You. I think to us. that's wonderful. Yeah. We should probably send some of the water itself to the schools all through the country and let them explore it and discover it for you. Yeah, so Asha and Annie, you both alluded to ways, structural ways in which it's difficult to do knowledge production outside the developed world or even within the developed world outside of academic institutions or even just elite academic institutions. And so since we're at MIT, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what a place like MIT could or should be doing to make their science more democratic. So I just think in general, when it comes to science, I think we need to stop thinking we're so special and that we speak a special language. And I think every publication should come with a, an abstract that's in layman English, which frankly makes it sound like we're dumbing it down, but we're not. The challenge is for us to actually learn how to communicate broader. Um, so I think that's a very simple first step and all journals should be expecting that at the very least. Um, and I just think there's a whole host of things that can be done from just like how do we retell those stories, how do we make sure that if you are publishing, you're committing to putting it out in some other form as well. Um, I mean, in Sri Lanka, not a single university has access to journals. I just want you to know that. And so, you know, we, again, you know, people who publish and are constantly publishing are live in a bubble where you can access papers whenever you want. And I'm a, I'm a scientist. I've been in big institutions all my life. I've moved back to Sri Lanka now, and I have to write to friends to access papers. That shouldn't be the case. So how can I innovate in science if I don't even know what's happening on the ground? Like, what's the foundation that I can build on? So, I mean, th they should all just be op open access. Yeah, like, I'm, I, yeah, I mean, I, I have a small nonprofit, and I don't have access to those journals, you know, and so it's the same process that I have to do for that, and it's, it's completely absurd that we lock away all the knowledge in these towers, and we don't let anyone else see it. And that's what motivated a lot of our publishing work, by the way. They're, they're a ripoff for the scientists who have to review the stuff for nothing, yeah. and then yeah. you people have to buy it, and the only people who get rich are the journals, so we said, why don't we bypass those journals? So <laughs> we are, and let Stephen me. Jay Gould, of course, was a champion of scientific writing that was made for people to understand. I wish he were still here. I'll just add that I think we, as scientists and as a community at these elite institutions, do privilege science. And we think it is this amazing source of knowledge that is the only source of knowledge. And that's not to say that science does not have a huge amount to contribute, but recognizing other forms of knowledge, traditional knowledge, is something that the legal and policy systems try to do. Usually uh, it's a process that's not super successful, but it's an attempt. And I think as scientists, one of the most important things we can do is realize that our scientific answers are not ultimate truth. And those are constructions of the way that we do science and the way that we understand scientific standards. But if we as scientists can recognize that there are other perspectives that are equally valuable in many cases to our own scientific knowledge, that is, a really important part of structuring solutions in effective ways and getting the information that we need to get to those solutions. We've given you the last word, Annie. I want to thank Asha and Sean, Greg and Annie, and I hope the rest of you and your perspectives have been enhanced as well. Thank you and onward. Thank you.